and Vice Chairman of the Uganda Episcopal Conference, Honorable John Chrysostom Moyingo, State Minister for Higher Education and Keynote Presenter, Director, National Seminary Gaba, Directors of Major Seminaries in Uganda, Distinguished Guests, Reverend Monsignors, Fathers, Brothers and Sisters, Invited Guests, Our Deacons and Seminarians, Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all and welcome you to St. Mary's National Major Seminary, and in particular to today's historical event, the public lecture. An auspicious occasion, opening the ground in preparation for our seminary Golden Jubilee, slated for the 12th of November. I'm Reverend Father Darius Magunda, a formator here at the National Seminary Gaba, and your MC for today. Permit me now to introduce to you today's program. We have the guests already here and all of us gathered. We shall be opening with the national anthem, the seminary anthem, an opening prayer led by the general spiritual director, introductory remarks by the rector, and then we shall have the keynote address by Honorable John Chrysostom Yingo. That will be followed by a vote of thanks by the Dean of Studies, and then the MC will introduce to us the moderators of today's public lecture. The first moderator will, will introduce the presenters in today's public lecture. The rest of the program, we have two presentations in the morning session, punctuated by a break, a tea break. But at the end of the first presentation, we shall have the inauguration of the Jubilee Anthem, which we shall all have the pleasure to listen to. After the second presentation and discussion, which will be from 11.30 to 12.30, we shall have remarks by the chairman of the Uganda Episcopal Commission on Priestly Formation. And this will be followed by lunch from 1 to 2.30 p.m. And then the third session will resume, will begin on two, from 2.30 to 3.30, and will be followed by discussions. And lastly, at 3.30, we shall have a speech by the guest of honor and the concluding prayer, which we hope will end by 4 p.m. today. We welcome you once again, and we wish you a fruitful participation in today's public lecture. And now at this juncture, I would like to ask you to stand and we sing the national anthem, followed by the seminary anthem, the prayer, and introductory remarks by the rector. Thank you very much.
in the in name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him in the noontime. you to send us the Holy Spirit. Bless us and bless all the activities of the day. Make a prayer through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. May Mighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much our dear General Spiritual Director, Father John Baptist Sonko. At this juncture, I would like to invite the Rector, National Seminary Gaba, to make the introductory remarks. And after that, he will invite the keynote speaker of the day to come and address us. On behalf of Gaba National Major Seminary, I warmly welcome the Right Reverend Dr. Robert Muhiru Akiki, Ordinal of Fort Porto Diocese, and our guest of honor today, and Vice Chairman of the Uganda Episcopal Conference. Akiki, you are most welcome. I particularly welcome Honorable Dr. Jonas Muyingo. State Minister for Education, who is our keynote addresser at this lecture. Honorable, you are most welcome. I warmly welcome Dr. Joseph Chisoga, Dr. Sveyo Tinomgisha, Mr. Anthony Matega, our main discussants. You are most welcome. I welcome Dr. Joseph Mary Sewinya and Professor B. St. Bajiri our moderators today. I warmly welcome the rectors of the major seminaries and all of you, our distinguished guests and participants, you are most welcome. Today's pre-celebration activity is a great academic and social moment of reflection as we look at the 50 years of Gaba National Seminary. I'm particularly grateful to the seminary academic department led by the Dean of Studies, Father Dr. Jude Charles Juko, for having organized this lecture under the theme, St. Mary's National Seminary at 50 years, as we look at our scores, challenges, and prospects. As we celebrate, we take this great opportunity to reflect on our life and the mission. Many things have happened and many have changed in the academic field as well as in the general setting of this seminary over the past 50 years. This golden jubilee, therefore, has provided us with a singular and unique opportunity to reflect on our successes, our challenges, and then to figure out our future plans. How far, we may ask ourselves, has the seminary vision, which is to form holy, convinced, committed, well-equipped, and pastoral-oriented Catholic priests been idealized so far? How has it shaped our seminary life and our products hereafter? The seminary, in addition to being a formation house, is also a place of intellectual enterprise and an arena of theological development. In recent years, I have in mind the theological and pastoral publications of our beloved late Dr. Benedict Setuma, his numerous articles. I have in mind the publications of fathers Dr. Vincent Sekavira, Dr. Jude Juko, 
Dr. Chiaz Senyondo, Father Senkubuge, and of our students who have produced some academic articles. The theological weeks in the 80s and 90s that we are held here in Igaba, they were moments of intellectual development and the contribution to the theological academia. At 50 years now, The candidates we train are from such a society, and to such a society, they are going to offer their services. If they are to be relevant and adequate, we need to have a reflection today and readjust our goals and modus operandi. Many priests who have gone through this seminary over the 50 years are today change makers. They are serving various communities and institutions in Uganda and beyond. We are therefore interested not only in what is happening here, but also in what happens hereafter. Effective, relevant, and adequate formation should translate into a relevant, effective, and reliable evangelizers, credible leaders of society. You are all most welcome once again to this public lecture. Today, as the but he stems from Ruero. Honorable, I'd like to thank you very much for having accepted when I went to his office. He had a lot of things, including being in Fort Porto today. Bishop will tell you, he's supposed to be in Fort Porto today. I think he will take a chopper and attend to other duties. But we thank you that you accepted to come and grace this occasion as Gaba Seminary looks at her life in the last 50 years. Honorable Doctor, you are most welcome. asking me whether I should take that seat down or stand, but you know, short people always want to be seen, <laughs> and that's the only way of seeing. <laughs> My Lord Bishop, the Vice Chairman of the Episcopal Conference, our Secretary, the Secretary General of the Episcopal Conference, the Rector of this National Seminary, my own father from my place. Why don't I address you as my colleagues? Would that be fair? I want to respect all the protocols that was presented by the rector. Ladies and gentlemen, in case there are ladies and gentlemen here, but I think they are. Good morning, everybody. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be in this place again. It's about 20 years ago when I last visited National Seminary. And I'd been invited to come and be part of a similar reflection, which I enjoyed very much, and I still remember the many great things that were said. It's a pleasure indeed to meet some of my old friends. There are people I've not met for quite a while, 
But when I saw them today smiling, I said, thanks be to God. I bring you very warm and prayerful greetings from the First Lady and the Minister of Education and Sports, who is aware that I'm here briefly because I'm accompanying his, her husband. I'm taking the husband to Luero. But she said, you go and you convey my love and warm greetings to everybody out there. Sometime back, your lecturer, who happens to be my friend, asked me to prepare to make a keynote address for this gathering. I asked myself this time. The other time, I, I knew why. This time, I kept asking why. About what? Why me? And up to now, I've not got the answers. Why he picked on me? You help me to answer why. Asked myself, could it be because of late I've been complaining quite a lot about the respect and the dignity, the products of the you know of, of this great institution? The good thing I would complain in Uganda. Those days for us, during our days, grandfather, we are Everybody would humble himself, wait for something. Great. These days, it's even very common to find in Namgongo when mass is going on. People with that badge, the seminary badge, very unique, moving around, eating, and you know, not bothered. Those days, You go away empty-handed. Empty those days, whenever he would say, even if he would just look around like this, smile a bit, the message would have would be heavily loaded. As time was, I've been complaining, hinting them, we have, we have the luck that we interact and do. Meet these people almost every day. But our people are continuing to be extremely poor. Why not emphasize? Injiri, yemkula kulana. Injiri, yokuvambuavu. Injiri, yokugaga. I've been complaining. Sometimes loudly. I said, could it be? These are so many complaints that this my friend of mine is trying to take me where I will be crucified. I've been message, which is very loaded in the Bible, is no longer being passed on properly to the one in Jesus. What about Om is he being looked at, the father, is he being looked at as a unifier, a father for everybody? Has in politics also come in to divide us up? It was worse last elections. So could it be these complaints I've been raising that this man wants to classify? Ladies and gentlemen, the questions have been many in my mind up to now not understood. Why? But after interacting with him, I discovered that he picked on me just to tickle your brains into a discussion that we are never asked to re-examine ourselves on what we do as he said in fulfilling our mission. We examine ourselves where we are still focused to our vision, the vision our founders built for this institution. Are we 
see a focus. That's what I discovered. That's how I got to know my mandate, my aid this morning. Of course, this will give us a deeper and a meaningful perspective to the Golden Jubilee celebrations. I hope you are conversant with the you've read about Abraham Lincoln, that youngest American president, when I talk about the vision. And then when you're just being arguably he is the president who served the shortest time. As he was the immediate after taking over the office, he went to visit the NASA headquarters. This is where I'm being young man to go into the moon. And he asked people to take him around the way I'm about to do to my brother here, take him around and see. Lincoln picked on, as he was moving around the corridors, he picked on that old man dressed in rats and sweating and moving almost everywhere, like some people do here. And he decided to give that man a hug and a handshake. People wanted, what do you do? So people asked him, Holy man, what do you do? The old man said, Oh, your excellency, every Monday I wake up to help America send at least one man onto the moon. This is this man the big picture. Do we have that picture in our arrangements? I think this is one of the things I think we are going to help ourselves. That's why I'm saying. If I understood my vision, very well, my mission, my revenge today, my responsibility today very well, I think it's just to tickle you in the discussion. And you give it ideas to think through how committed we are to our vision, how we are looking at our mission, and many, many things. Of course, I must congratulate you if this is correct. I must congratulate you for taking off time. To think through, to examine the way you do things. Remember that great thinker, Socrates, who said, Life that is not to be examined is not worth anything. Your life in this scenario, as far as you are concerned, is worth anything because you are going to be examined. I want to thank you very much in advance. I guess. But most of you, when you heard of the upcoming events of the seminary, your minds went straight to the big cut of eats and the brains. And maybe the we attended, we attended this mass celebrated by many priests. I remember my days as a seminarian. Remember they said, we had a, a big celebration in Yenna Seminary one time, celebrating I think 50 years. All I expected, I hope you are not going to fall into this trap. All I expected is a big eating, a big party, great bishops, this coming. I hope that is going to be today. Marking the three years of existence of a situation like this one means, means much more than partying. We take this opportunity to recall the beginning of the seminary, the purpose, the goals for which it was established, and then. Look what the achievements attained over time. It's also an opportune moment to reflect on the institutional challenges and then get our future plans clearly set. The church has over the, over the centuries taken a leading role in the various social aspects of her people. The church's contribution to the health, education, economic sectors is evident to us. Here in Uganda, the first education, educational and health care institutions were established by the church. And we acknowledge and appreciate as a government the foresightedness of the missionaries of those days. Hmm? We dearly appreciate them. National major seminaries are part of the church's effort to educate and train various people for the good of the society. The training of priests who eventually head and guide communities goes far beyond serving the spiritual needs of the people. Bishops and the priests 
are part of the transforming agents of society for the good and not only of the believers but also the entire society. So when I see corruption, corruption in government, funny, funny things taking place in the country, one first question I ask myself, are my people in the seminary doing enough? Although, this, although I look at it that way, there are quite a number of achievements we have made. 50 years of foundation of Gaba National Seminary is a very wonderful landmark, which we cannot afford to ignore. I checked the statistics. I, I found that the statistics shows that the, for the first 50 years, our national seminary has produced almost 2,000 priests. I think we need to clap for this, isn't it? I look at the 2,000, all of them going to Uganda, society, ha, effectively performing. I don't see any stealing from another. I even see 19 bishops have been manufactured from here. And many lay pastor agents serving society all over the country. There are those, there are also many. These individuals educated and trained in this seminary are today the leaders and the game changers of our society in Uganda and even beyond. And I'm one of the products. And I consider myself a game changer because I went through the seminary. Bishops. And I'm very proud of that, by the way. I'm very proud that I went through the seminary. And it's because of the seminary that I'm what I, I'm what I am. I'm very proud. And when I was appointed minister, maybe it also explains why I've stayed in that office for long. I told my president that I'm not coming like, to be any, like any, other priest, any other politician. I came to evangelize through politics. And I think I've done it because I went through the seminary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found when there were no prayers in the ministry, I said, so long as I'm here as a minister, whatever activity, we must start with prayer, we must close with prayer. And that's what happens there in the ministry. I thank God for preparing me to be a, prayer for, a prayerful man. Bishops and priests have, over the years, one, shaped the spiritual and moral lives of people. This service leads to a peaceful and harmonious society. Two, priests have founded schools and hence directly promoted education and transformation of society. Three, these are achievements we need to be proud of. Many pastoral agents have directly initiated socioeconomic activities in agriculture, in health, Microcredit schemes and charitable endeavors, which have very positively impacted on the Ugandan society. As government, we appreciate this. I look at the initial goals. When you look at the goals, one, I want us to look at the need for local clergy. Africa taking charge of its affairs. When you read the works, the writings of the late father, John Mary Waligo, he did a lot as far as tracing and explaining the phases of African Christianization as far as it's concerned. In, this, in his work, Training Indigenous Clergy in Uganda, he tracks the founding of seminaries in Uganda, and I want to invite all of you, interest you in look up, uh, the ladies research. The founding of Gaba National Seminary was remotely in line with the Trendantine innovations of establishing seminaries in dioceses, local churches, but more particularly in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council of promoting and training local clergy. To a big extent, this objective has been achieved in the past 50 years of Gaba. And I want to congratulate you. Many diocesan priests have been trained here and are still being trained. However, much as Africans are today evangelizing their fellow Africans, we need to ask ourselves how far we have gone regarding managing our affairs. I would like to know, and maybe 
this lecture will bring the matter out how far Gava has gone in bringing up homemade theological, social, organization, and ecclesiastic systems which reflect our situation, our African needs, and our African challenges. We need, I want you to reflect on that. Attention must be paid to bringing up candidates who have the capacity to handle our local conditions and the needs. Are our local clergy relevant to the local African? All for our case. Are they relevant for Ugandan situation? Establishment of seminaries and training of indigenous clergy was meant, I would like to say, to Africanize our affairs and come up with relevant solutions. However, this does not mean independence and the separation from the universal church, but rather contextualization of Christianity and church life. The founding of such church institutions coincided with Uganda's independence wave. Because the mid-1960s and the 70s were times with a great feeling of and desire for Africa to manage its own affairs. The clergy should play a major role in this direction. Uganda is still lagging behind in the in the proper efforts to shape her destiny in politically, economically, even education-wise. Our local church is still also suffering from dependency syndrome. How is the clergy today prepared to form and lead communities which bring, bring out their potential? A society that can satisfactorily manage her affairs. The dependency syndrome you see a big stumbling block to development and the self-realization of the church and the state as well. And Uganda in particular. Is still greatly looking, Uganda is still greatly looking at external players for handling her economic and social challenges. We spend much of the time going to Washington. For what? For resources. As we get those resources, they dictate what is going to happen. We are giving you one million, you must handle it this way. Even some of us who are in education, we are emphasizing research. Much of the resources that come, come from outside and they will tell you what their interest is and that's what you research into. What can be done to reasonably take charge of our affairs? This is the question I'm asking, which you should be asking at various levels. Does our seminary promote Rightful attitude and efforts towards a genuinely self-conscious people and a contextualized African church. Today, as we look at the past 50 years, we need to point out what our training has achieved in the academia and otherwise. To Africanize our processes and solutions. If we continuously depend on external players economically, we should remember as Thomas Sankara said, he who feeds you controls you. This is the point I'm making. The second point is about national unity. I would like you to find time and think seriously about national unity. Post independence Uganda was evidently politically paralyzed. Politically paralyzed. The then political groupings were clearly influenced by religion and ethnic, ethnicity, mainly. Efforts to realize a united independent Uganda were certainly in place, but with enormous hurdles. On the part of the Catholic Church, having a national seminary at such a moment was a great chance to train priests with a national perspective. Don't you think so, people? That was a big chance. Have we lost it? It was hoped that pastor agents from all over Uganda, trained in the same system here, would be instrumental in fostering national unity and reconciliation, beginning with a reasonable period of studying together in the seminary, and then put that into a larger contest 
of a united Uganda, United Society. Priests, as people in charge of communities and various institutions, are daily in touch with the masses. Their actions and plans certainly have an enormous multiplier effect. You may not have noted, some of you, uh, but I th I'll ask you to note too, as I go back to sit, take my seat. The way I walk is exactly the way my lector used to walk when, you were, when we were serious in media. You can see the influence. Those of you who didn't have a chance to, 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 to live with you, <laughs> mine is now late. Pious, Pio, Father Pio. And when you look at all the priests who are in my country, the way they behave is exactly Pio's way of behavior. <laughs> Their actions and plans certainly have an enormous multiplier effect, I said. As we mark the 50 years of Gawa's existence, because we spend a lot of time with you. That's why you have so much influence on even the way we think, the way we walk. But why have we failed to influence that unity? As we mark the 50 years of Gaba existence, we need to revitalize these very important objectives of the Founding Fathers. Priests are social influencers in many aspects. If there are so many people who are trained here, go to the society with the proper attitude on national unity, so much can be realized as we continue to struggle for a united Uganda. Yeah, everybody should work towards that. It can be very interesting. Work will be easy. We are still challenged as a nation. Genuine unity and a peaceful coexistence are still superficial and a shake. I, you, 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 I, I wanted to give my examples, but I'm, I, I, need to, I need to be very careful. I saw some camera people here. I think training, but, but you have understood. I think training at Gaba must pay particular attention to bringing up priests for sure, who are enthusiastic about and ready to work for the United Uganda. Your products must be promoters of reconciliation, must be promoters of unity and a national consciousness. This will not come out of the blue. Seminarians must live this way while still here. What next? I just want to, there's a gentleman called, I call him my servant, so he's called Mr. Semper. I don't know whether he is. Uh, that gentleman. I want him to sh ask him to share with you that uh, what happens on the Amukutu. Kampala. Mr. Sempa, what is it called? Rubal Cathedral Foundation. You see what the Christian are saying about you. <laughs> Wanted to share, but those camera people. Mm -hmm. While acknowledging Gaba's specific character as a formation house for future church ministers, the seminar is also an academic institution. Theological, pastoral, and social studies are approached in the same way like institutions of higher learning do. Students here pursue diplomas and degrees in theology pastoral and some social studies. Over the past 50 years, GABA has awarded certificate diplomas and degrees, though in affiliated status. You are, are you Al Albania? Ah, ah, ah. After such a long time in the academic arena, GABA National Seminary ought to have developed and initiated academic programs which can lead to awarding of its own degrees. Why not? Mwingo is the minister in charge. Why should you wait for the DLA? <laughs> I asked Mary Okwakol, professor, who is in charge of National, High, National Council for Higher Education. Asked her yesterday, why hasn't he like, given permission to Gaba to operate as a full-fledged university? Said Mary is a Catholic. Can you hear that? Say, those people have all that is needed, but they have never asked for, for it. I hope my bishop is hearing. <laughs> <coughs> mm. 
my bishop, I'm saying that all efforts must be undertaken in the next phase to lead this seminary to a higher academic level. In other words, to a free established university. Government under the teacher's policy is saying within the next eight years, nobody will be allowed to enter any of our classrooms to teach without a degree. We want to prepare. We, we, our government you know, says that, recognizes that the most important gift you can give to this country is quality education. And the quality education depends so extremely much on the quality of the teacher. That's why we are saying the teacher will do well on facilitated, remunerated. We have started with science, scientists. Those of you who did the arts, don't complain. Your day is about to come. Highly trained, even if you are teaching nursery. But I imagine what will happen when that policy, when it starts biting, and my friend in a, a castle is, he said, please, sorry, you cannot enter here because my bishop has had. Bishop, I'm, I'm calling for a fully established university. Socially, useful faculties can be started without compromising the purpose for which the seminary was founded. Many more people can profit from this institution in, in case social, economic, development and health facility fac faculties are put in place. In addition to the theological faculty, move, okay. moving towards a fully fledged university would also enable some lay people like me to get access to theological studies. Really, why do you want to keep it to yourselves? Is it possible? You have allowed me to pick whatever nonsense there is on the internet. Why not come here so that you prepare me very well to go and evangelize? What are, oh, imagine I'm evangelizing over something I have very little knowledge. No, those days are gone. Hmm? I think up to now, you seem to be this seems to be a prerogative <laughs> of only the priests hmm? prospective priests and some few religious sisters even you sit man you keep us away why you don't want us to join you when it comes to going to Christ Kale. <laughs> We already have examples of religious formation institutions which also serve a wide academic cause. Hmm? But there is something very near here. The Catholic University of Eastern Africa is a very good example. By the way, uh, when you, some of you have taken off time to go and see what's happening in these developed countries, let people are helping the priests so much if they have their correct information and we are ready to do it to make me in charge of evangelizing to cabinet oh i'll do it with a lot of happiness give me the tools why don't i conclude it's a great opportunity we have today to look at the life of gaba seminary after 50 years of foundation it's a moment to assess the goals of these institutions and how far they have been realized. We have all reasons to celebrate and to give thanks to God for all that has been achieved so far. I wish you nice and fruitful deliberations as we forge a way forward for the next 50 years. I want, what should Gaba be like in the next 50 years? That's the question I want you to, leave, to stay with. What should the pastoral agents to be equipped with in order to be relevant in the present and the future rapidly changing society? Seriously think through that. New times. <laughs> By the way, the priests were coming out and plus of my colleagues, the teachers, were big troubles. Big troubles and you need really to think through the training. Which big troubles? 
you go out thinking that you are the only one who has the knowledge. Somebody you are evangelizing to has read the entire Bible, has read the interpretation of everything. On Sunday, you go thinking you are the one who is going to see, to be pro, the, who is going to say something useful. He has all that he needs to from the internet. New times and the new challenges demand new answers. May God bless Gava. Thank you very much, organizers, for inviting me. And I wish you the best celebrations for God and my country. I'm not qualified to cast a vote of thanks. I, would, I will ask the Dean of Studies National Seminary Gava to come and do that. Thank you very much. With Mary in a gratitude to God, that is the theme of our Jubilee celebration. My Lord Bishop, the guest of honor, on behalf of everyone here and those following on Zoom, I profoundly thank you, Honorable Minister, Jesse Miingo, our own, for the inspirational, informative, and thought-provoking address you have given us. <laughs> the thoughts you have shared with us show the immensity of knowledge in the area of priestly formation and uh, priestly life. And of course, your keen interest in the mission of the church. The audience is now aware that Honorable Minister willingly accepted our request to be, I mean, to give uh, the keynote address. But later on, a task came his way to accompany the president to Ruero today, in a few hours to come. He never turned us down. He made sure he first comes and he fulfill the commitment he made with us. <laughs> we therefore owe you a special vote of thanks for that. We look forward to receiving you again here so that you may continue to share with us your constructive thoughts as we have, we have tested and testify. May God bless you and we wish you a safe journey back home Safe journey to Ruero. Thank you very much, our Dean of Studies, Father Jude Juko. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to recognize the presence of the rectors of the major seminaries. We have the rector of Gulu Halokolum. National Seminary. Father Olwen, you're most welcome. We have the Rector of St. Imbaga uh, Major Seminary. International Seminary, they say. <laughs> welcome. Uh, may I ask the Vocations Directors present to stand up for recognition? Vocations Directors, in case we have any. Would like to recognize, yes, welcome. 
would like to recognize the members of the Jubilee Organization Committee. Please stand up for recognition, including our students. Members of the Jubilee Organization Committees, please stand up for recognition. And we have the Communications Director of the Uganda Episcopal Conference, Father Philip Odi. You are most welcome. We shall introduce the other members as time goes on. Allow me at this juncture to introduce to you one of the moderators who will introduce the first presenter of this public lecture. And this is none other than Reverend Father Dr. Joseph Mary Sebunya. Father, I will ask you to stand up and uh, we welcome you officially. Please take your seat. Reverend Father Dr. Joseph Mary Sebunya and his colleague whom I will introduce later, these are very big men to just compress and summarize in a short time. But I will try my best to say a few things about Father Dr. Joseph Mary Sebunya. He was ordained priest in 2003 and currently is a lecturer and formator at St. Timbaga Major Seminary. He's the head of the Faculty of Theology at St. Timbaga and in the diocese is the coordinator of Kampala Archdiocese's Children and Youth Development. Father Dr. Sevunya is a distinguished theologian and formator. After his seminary studies at the Nswanjere Preparatory Seminary and Chisubi Minor Seminary, he went to St. Imbaga, where he obtained a diploma in philosophy and a Bachelor of Philosophy from Urbaniana University, an internal diploma in theology, and the Bachelor of Theology from Urbaniana University in 2003. From 2006 to 2009, he pursued a licentiate in Biblical Theology at the Santa Croce University in Rome, and later proceeded to John Paul II Institute of Lateran University, where he obtained a doctorate in Biblical Theology in 2013. Dr. Sevunya has, in the course of his studies, distinguished himself as an intelligent learner, learner, an assiduous reader, and a linguist. He was the best student of his class at St. Imbaga in 2003, and the best student in biblical theology at Santa Croce University in Rome. Among the several awards obtained, I wish to mention just a few outstanding ones. A certificate in German from the Goethe Institute in Bonn, Germany, a certificate in Italian from the Santa Croce University in Rome, a certificate in Classic Hebrew and Greek from the Duke University of USA. I think that's particularly interesting to our students who enjoy those subjects. And lastly, a certificate in the Free Market and Ethics from the Acton University, Michigan in the USA. Dr. Sebunya has served as a member on several boards of governors of schools and hospitals. It suffices to mention but a few. Lubaga Hospital, Kampala Archdiocese Land Board, and Board of Consultors of Kampala Archdiocese. These are just among the few I can mention. So I don't have much time to exhaust all. I would like to invite you at this juncture to introduce to us the first presenter of today's public lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our MC, for those kind words of introduction. You made the CV longer than it sounds. <laughs> I thank the guest of honor and the keynote speaker and all the protocol that has been recognized. From this point on, I want to dispense the future speakers from going through the, all the protocol in the interest of time. If you can, you may mention our chief guest and the rest of the audience. And which I want to let you know, as our dean has told us, this audience is bigger than it looks here. Because, as the honorary minister said, we live in an opportune moment of technology. So we are joined 
those of us here physically by a virtual audience of so many millions of viewers that are hating us and following us through social media and thanks to the Catholics online for transmitting this conference live. So all of you, wherever you are, most welcome. As I said, I want to thank the organizers for this invitation. As has been mentioned, I am both humbled and honored to moderate at this public lecture. Humbled because I'm standing between distinguished men and women of academics and leadership, but also honored because even if I didn't go through the walls of this seminary, I've kind of been an associate alumnus of this seminary because my priest who baptized me, Musinya Kanyeles, was a lecturer here for a long time. And about 90% of all my formators and pastors and spiritual directors in my seminary life have come from this seminary. So am I wrong to say I'm an alumnus by association of this seminary? So I hope we get that slot, associate alumni of St. Mary's, and we shall be proud to belong. And as I said, our presentations this morning are bringing together this wonderful experience of the Jubilee in a public lecture. And as you know, a public lecture is an event that kind of opens up a dialogue. In a way, St. Mary's is opening its gates and windows to the rest of society to let them know what happens here. And so whatever you're saying here, Yeshua is on record, both on social media and through Zoom to the rest of the world. So can you make that message loud and clear that you are St. Mary's? Can I hear some members of St. Mary's say, we are St. Mary's? Yeah, I see some scouts. They normally raise their hands and say, We are St. Mary's. We are St. Mary's. Yes. Send that message. And St. Mary's listens to the rest of society outside. We have heard the input of the Honorable Minister. And in a few minutes, we are going to have an input from some of our very excellent speakers that have been selected on purpose. And without wasting more time, I just want us to put together this environment. I prefer that it is a familiar environment. Because sometimes when people hear a lecture, they become stiff and threatened about what's going to happen. I assure you there's not going to be an examination after this. Dean of Studies assured me of that. But as you know, the best exam is in real life. As the Honorable Minister has been saying. At every moment you're here, all the inspirations that you get are going to be translated in real life. And if that's true, then we are on a very big lecture platform of the world. I want to make my own the words of the director as he opened this session. Because I find the punchline he gave uniting the lectures we are going to hear this morning. It was a quote from Pope John Paul II's uh, letter. Novo millennio in eunte. You remember that? The first sharp paragraph had these words. Let us remember the past with gratitude, live the present with enthusiasm, and look forward to the future with confidence. I hope these words link together what we are going to hear in a few moments. First of all, the first session as you have it is entitled A History of Priestly Formation in Igaba. Scores challenges, and prospects. This is an invitation to step back in history to find reasons for thanksgiving and celebration. And as you will soon discover, no person is better suited to lead us into this discussion than our first presenter, whom I'm glad to present to you at this moment. He is a simple man of God with a great profile. He's a true son of Uganda and the church. And definitely one of the finest products St. Mary's has ever produced. He's born in Ikavale in 1956. He joined Chitabi Minor Seminary in 1970, 
which is the same year St. Mary's was founded. He, after his philosophical studies in Katigondo, between 75 and 78, he joined this great seminary, St. Mary's Gava, for theology between 1978 and 81. And he was present when St. Mary's Seminary celebrated 10 years as a student. After his ordination, he was sent to the Pontifical Urban University in Rome, where he acquired a master's degree in dogmatic theology. And for two years, he taught in Katigondo before returning to Rome for his PhD in dogmatic theology. In 1991, he successfully defended and published his doctoral dissertation entitled Ecclesiological Meaning of Small Christian Communities. He triumphantly returned to Uganda and was appointed lecturer at the prestigious Theologicum for this of St. Mary's for two decades, between 1991 to 2021. No, 2011. He became, as Dean of Studies, among other responsibilities here, he became a household name in this seminary. For those of you who are not here at that time, those of us who used to pass by here, remember him around the compound. And when Dr. Muyingo talked of his rector, trying to imitate his rector, I could imagine how many people tried to, Im to imitate the guest speaker, the way he walked on the compound, very smartly, and always on time. And he led and inspired many seminarians with his great sense of humor, winning the admiration of both students and colleagues with his intellectual, spiritual, and social qualities. He left us a legacy as one of the longest serving staff members. He was present when St. Mary's celebrated 25 years in 1995. In 2011, he was invited to serve as Vicar General of his home diocese in Ikavale, a duty he faithfully executed for another decade until last year, 2021. He is currently serving as a parish priest at Nyachiwale Parish in Ikavale Diocese. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't exhaust the CV of our speaker, but allow me to say, can we welcome our next presenter, very reverend Monsignor Siverio Trinomogisha. You can keep clapping until he arrives here, okay? Now I have to stand before you, or sit before you, under scrutiny. A lot has been said about me. I, I, know, I know it, but uh, some, well, well, it was a bit of, yeah, it is, it, it's, it's me, it's mine. <laughs> I will be add, but, but it's mine. Also, well, only that I was in the St. Paul Seminary in Kabale. Uh, I, I didn't go to Chicago because at that time we had begun studying 
in Kamale, but my people keep on following me when they study seminary for their minor seminary training. Secondly, as I was here, I was also serving as the National Security Secretariat of the Episcopal Conference and in Doctrine and Faith. So that is also part of my CV, which, because the Secretary General is around, which I should pronounce somewhere, <laughs> considered untrue to myself. So, um, I, let me put some things out here so that I don't need to look for them when I need them for reference. Then we can move ahead. So, so <coughs> we, are we are very, very grateful that the National Seminary has, has reached, reached 50 years. years. 50, 50 years, years of, of institution is not a big thing, maybe. maybe. Because, because the institution, institution can, can live for almost, almost forever. forever. So, so 50 years, years is like, like a cup of tea, it should, it should be. be. Because those 50 years, years we shall mark everything, everything that the institution will be. The books are there. there. The stem depends, depends on them. them. And so, and so they, they may be short, short compared to the long life, life of the institution, institution but they are, they are basic. basic. Because they have broken it, it and, and they made it. So, so congratulations to the National Seminary. So, National so Seminary, Seminary Gama 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 began, began in a, in a unique way as, as National, National, National Seminary. Seminary. And many, and many people, people knew it only as National. National. If you say, say you are going to National, National, we knew we that, that you are going to National, National Seminary. Gama. Gama. So, so that's, that's the basic identity of my being here when I was here, here was, was to be that I was national. national. I belong to the nation. It, it, it has a national, national character, character, character and it was supposed to form priests with a national spirit. Not politically, but that a person could feel at home and work with people from every part of Uganda the different languages, different cultures, as well as different appearances. Although we may look very different, however, we should know that we are all black. Black is our identity. One day we had a parish priest, and he was my rector, but at that time he was parish priest, and he was from Germany. So one of the People around laughed at his fellow Ugandan and said, you are black like charcoal. And the, the man was surprised. He said, ha! And he said it loud. He said, and the kettle said to the pot, your bottom is black. And for the, pe the people didn't understand, but I understood and I was full of laughter. How can you tell an African, you are very African, we, so, to be African is to be black. And we should be proud of by being black. If you want to know a few details about the blackness of the Bible, you can, uh, you can ask Monsignor Rokel to tell you what he has written about. I used to like talking about the black aspect of the Bible, or whatever you may call the African aspect of the Bible and the Kush character of the Bible, or the Kushite. So the journey to the formation of this seminary was rather long, long and dramatic. You can read a lot about it. It was thought about way back in the mid-1960s, when the bishops of Uganda felt the need to create an institution that would f form a united clergy in Uganda. To form a united clergy in Uganda. So in 1964, the bishops agreed that the final aim of the Uganda hierarchy is one national semin seminary with an African rector 
for all candidates to the priesthood. That was during their plenary meeting of the 17th of April, 1964. So, and so, the first director here was an African. And they had to look after different nationalities, some white, some black, who were staff members here. But it was a commitment by the bishops. Let us have a national seminary with an African rector. That may seem to be a small thing, but it was a commitment that made the character of the seminary outstanding, and it was then possible to have a seminary that was really African and Ugandan to form a national priest, united and full in solidarity with other priests in this nation. Secondly, the church wanted priests who were adequately formed, diocesan priests that were adequately formed. The word adequate is pregnant. What do you mean by adequate? That they had enough formation to live and work as priests. It is one way, one thing to work, but it is also another thing to live. Because you could work, 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 but the priesthood is not lived at all. So this desire to have a national clergy built on unity and solidarity bringing together diverse languages in Uganda and the cultures that go with them, it was really important that if this, uh, the clergy could move together in one direction and the different so-called tribes were to be themselves and positively contribute to the formation and to the development of our people as Catholics and as Christians, Uganda would be a wonderful mosaic of cultures, but especially a special synergy would come out that would prepare us to a new independent uh, identity grounded on the example of the Uganda matters, as Pope Paul would put it, in, his, uh, in, the, in what he writes on the, on the occasion of the Uganda matters, as you only read in the breviary on the 3rd of June, for the 3rd of June, that a new culture and a new people, will, it needs to come out in Africa from the example of the Uganda matters, so that a new culture, a new people, a new church is born that is like the Uganda matters. Little, small, insignificant they could have been, but they worked together, they moved together in solidarity to be and to act like Christ, carry his cross joyfully and firmly until they died for their faith. No persuasion would make them go away. Says, you are young. Why can't you leave these people? Jesus, you are young. I can't protect you. Say, no, I'm going with my friends. and We are going to die like our master. So the Pope was very much impressed. And it is this church that we need to look, about, at, at, look at. What are the Uganda matters to us? Who are they? And what are we doing with this identity and this solidarity that you could form and be leadership for a new society that is inspired by the life of the Uganda matters? Not only the life, but also the death. But their life and death 
are together because even their death is a birth into birth into a new life. And it is a birth that has inspired many. For me, I was uh, disturbed when I heard that some people had moved on foot from Kavale to this place. They were 13 in number in 2009. There was a little man, a small man, saying, yes, I have moved on foot and I'm here. And I looked at him, I said, is something wrong in your head or you are right? But the man had walked and he was here on foot. And for me to walk to, <laughs> to Kampala town, <laughs> to Kampala city is too much. And here he was. And every year people are walking this way. This is the new Uganda that we can see growing up. As things are moving around, the problems are faced by others and created by many more others. A group of people take the Uganda matters as their example and they do things that would not expect people to do. Secondly, Uganda had previously had three major seminaries and they belonged to the three major missionary societies that had evangelized us. Katigondo was called St. Thomas Aquinas Major Seminary and it, was, it belonged to the White Fathers or to the missionaries of Africa. And it, not only, it had students not only from Uganda but also some from Tanzania, Bukoba, which was also under the White Fathers at that time. So the second one was the one of the Mirhi missionaries, which was called St. Mary's Major Seminary, Gaba, and it was next door. And this was for the areas that began with Zambia eastwards, uh, including Jinja, Tororo, even Lugazi, of course, then Soroti, and then some parts of Western Kenya. We had also another one of the Komboni missionaries, or we used also to call them the Verona Fathers, and they had a seminary in Guru, and it also it, it served the areas under the Verona Fathers in northern Uganda. So each seminary had its own emphasis, had a full-fledged staff, and it had its own character. And when the time came for forming major seminaries, these were generally f uh, to be turned maybe into uh, to be turned into national seminaries, but it did not, it did not always happen. But successfully, Katigondo became a national seminary. And the, the GABA, however, was created, at that, was created as a national major seminary. And students, the first students who came here, were supposed to be from all the seminaries. And it became a combination of students and staff coming from different areas. And this was challenging. The first students did not find it very easy to, to, to cope with the situation because you have all these staffs with different backgrounds and the rector who was chosen, he must be African and it was a challenging situation. So this seminary, which replaced the other missionary seminaries, uh, it, it began, but it was a difficulty for the people who began, and it is understandable that it was not easy to patch up together these people to form one seminary. 
Thanks be to God, the experiment and the project survived those years. So, so what happened on the 9th of February 1966, an Episcopal Building Committee for the, semin the new seminary was appointed and it was headed by Bishop Vincent Macaulay or Vincent Macaulay of Fort Portal, assisted by Bishop James Odongo of Tororo and Bishop Adrian Chivumbi Dungu of Masaka. This was the original team. After the, co the committee had explored the two sites, that is in Sambia Hill and Gaba Hill, given by the Archbishop Emmanuel Nsubuga of Kampala Archdiocese for the construction of the seminary, the bishops settled for Gaba Hill. And that is where we are today. More to that, something influenced the way the seminary was built. In the 60s, an earthquake struck Fort Portal and it destroyed the cathedral. And Bishop Macaulay had to build a new cathedral and I think other buildings. And these had to be earthquake proof. Our proof. Do you say earthquake proof? Yes. And our building is supposed to be earthquake proof as well. That is why it looks a bit like an aeroplane has pillars on the outside and water runs all around it but does not enter it many times and so, and so forth and so on. Few good things also are in this area, in the architecture. For example, the chapel is on top and at the center. Jesus, God, is the center of this place and is the head of this community. And in the beginning, those who were here thought that there was an idea to build all around this building and have the communities just going in from different angles, coming to the chapel and to the dining. But the idea was not accepted by some people. They thought, since there is land, let us build at a bit of a distance so that when there is uh, something happening in the houses, it does, not, uh, it does not also sound in the chapel and so forth, and in the lecture hall. And so a bit of distance was created between uh, the common building and the residences. And I think that was wise because a, a little bit of land is around for, um, for more constructions because of that. But it is a very unique construction and it is community-like, bringing people together, around, and up for their prayers of the people. At first, it was a little teasing because we were not used to be up there in the chapel. We wanted to have a bit of privacy in the dark place. But, and there you are in the light, and glass is all around you. But it was a new understanding and Christ is the light. Let us go forward, isn't it? So this is the bit of the architecture, and we are very grateful to Bishop Macaulay for what he did, having learned from the experience he had in Fort Portal, and out of the love he had for the formation of priests in Uganda. And <clears throat> as the seminary went on, a number of gaps were realized. Some of the gaps were in the liturgy. For example, when we arrived, we arrived here in 1978, there was no benediction. Because some people may have believed that benediction is not liturgy. Because there is the sacrament, but maybe it is part of the sacramentals because the blessing so, um, liturgy of the hours was practically heavier on the liturgy than benediction. 
that when Bishop Sekamanya was rector at that time, the benediction began. And some of us who had been so much attached to benediction, something of our spirituality was also ah, encouraged. Uh, you could now be in benediction and the incense comes in your nose and then in your breathing and the devotion was felt and smelt as well as seen and participated in. One of the big contributors of uh, the Gaba spirit and bringing the students together was Monsignor Alex Mukasa. He, was, he had a way of gently putting together the different mentalities of staff members and of students. He had some humorous way of putting, making corrections. For example, one day we were having a rector's talk and he told us what he had seen before. He said, last, I think it was last Friday, there was a rector's talk and as you had just left, I gathered my books and as I was going out, a number of students were walking triumphantly for breakfast, having missed the rector's talk. So when people heard triumphantly, they did not feel very triumphant. <laughs> <laughs> and attendance of rector's talks became more serious. <laughs> that is the way he used to take us and become very serious, but having brought the point in a way that made us also happy, not always very sad. The objectives of solidarity and unity among the students had many challenges. And some of the challenges were political. And what I observed at that time is that the students that were here, as well as in other places, Ugandans, we tended to personalize problems. And we thought that when one person goes, the problems will go. The problem is that persons, persons went and the problems have stayed and remained. Some politician and one, some military man one day told, I asked him, but there are things which we, have, we see and they are very strange. Uh, a government comes and some problems for some time disappear, but they come back. What, what is the problem? He said, my dear friend, governments have similar ways of defending themselves. And they may only change in personality, but the defense mechanisms are the same. So how can we move from this personalization of problems and we see an internalized way of understanding and correcting as well as solving such a problems so that they don't eat deep into our unity when in actual fact they are outside us but they become so much of our problems and uh, we, 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 we become so part of um, partisan in them, we, we, we identify with them so much that sometimes they use it to poison our community life. When the politics of DP, UPC were here, some students would not greet one another like, like brothers. It was war. Why should it be war? Because none of us were the founder of UPC and none of us were the founder of DP. And Jesus Christ never, never belonged to any of those parties. During the 1979 war, there was a lot of solidarity because we were suffering together. And even before that, we had had a lot of solidarity during the celebration of the, Uganda, of the centenary of the faith in 1979, where we were part of the choirs and playing the drums of our, from our area. I remember I played the Runyankuru Shiga drum songs. 
So if we hear there are some mistakes in those recordings, know that they came from my hands. But we were part and parcel of the celebrations. But after that, things were not always easy. There came the, the parties and the solidarity seems to have been thrown out of the window. But there were, of course, not everybody got into problems, but the exaggerations were there. And these problems persist eating at the unity of priests, of seminarians, and when we go to the field, they become even sometimes more pronounced. With some people belonging to some politician and ready to carry out plans that may be on the border of being immoral and if not criminal. So we were proud to be in this beautiful place that was built very well and people would look at our buildings and would be mesmerized and we would say welcome to Gaba. Feel at Gaba. Welcome to Gaba. Feel at Gaba. But there was also some, something to equalize or to balance things. It was, this is Gaba. So in some way they will say, there are people, <laughs> you are very new, you will get tired and you will be like us also. <laughs> but it was wonderful to live in this place. Ah, the sports here was wonderful and the singing in the chapel, all oh, the drums and so forth would feel very good really. And the, 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 the football. Bishop Wamika used to be a serious player of football. And one day there was a football match and there was a deacon Oktoy from um, Soroti, Etelu, I think Etelu. And he played the ball and he missed the score. But there was a deacon standing somewhere there and he, there was a, a strong kick from behind on him. He was a spectator and somebody kicked him. So he looked behind and there was a lady who had kicked him. And he looked <laughs> <laughs> the lady who just had <laughs> closed her eyes and was apologizing. But that how, that's how it was exciting. So during those difficult times, things brought us together. Sports, liturgy, and work, and study, studies. And life was not as bad as it may have appeared, but it was beautiful. And we appreciate the national character that this seminary brought to us. You no longer saw tribes as maybe policemen and military, and others as maybe uh, your administrators whom you had uh, grudges about. You, began, you saw people as individuals with their strengths and their weaknesses. And this was for us a discovery, especially for us who came from up country. Hey, so this man comes from places where there are policemen and he's a seminarian. Thanks be to God. So we welcomed the challenges and we were able to live together, together and we are able to meet and some of the people who came from here kept that solidarity so much that I remember one person telling me that he was in a place and a, a, a soldier came to check on him because they had accused him of harboring guerrillas and his friend came, he found that they had studied together in Gaba. Oh, they began greeting one another. He said, now, tell me, honestly, are there guerrillas in your place? The man looked at him, honestly, honestly. He said, I'm sorry to tell you, but there are some. <laughs> His friend wept. And he said, may God help you. And the army and the core team went back 
they never checked him. So it was a strong solidarity among some people that beyond, went beyond even the fear of being maybe uh, executed for failing on duty. And this person protected his friend and they never checked him. Unfortunately, when he went to reward him for what he did, he found that he had died during the war. This solidarity, therefore, may not have been always at its best, but it was real. When I went to Pai Mall for a pilgrimage in 2010, I found seminarians from here whom I had taught, and I was at home in a guru. And this is the story I can repeat whenever I go. There are seminarians and priests. There are priests and seminarians who had studied here and priests who had studied here. And you feel that you can survive anywhere. You will, you will be welcomed and you are at home. So, I could go on talking about these things, but maybe we go to a bit of what brought us here. A bit of history is good. And I cannot exhaust all the history. Maybe what I want to tell you is that the D-Day came and the opening was done. And when the opening was done, it was also not a simple affair. It was a big day. So on October 21st, 1970, the, the seminary was dedicated and officially opened Monsignor Antonio Mazza, Secretary of St. Peter the Apostle, who had played a crucial role in the funding of the buildings, was present. The government of Uganda was represented by His, Excellent, His Excellency John Babiha, the Vice President and Minister of Animal Resources. So it was both a church and a state issue. We, it was history being made on the 21st of October, 1970. So, when it was opened, that is what we found, and we were able to enjoy the fruits of those people who labored, and were some of the people who maybe gave it a new character. I am remaining with a few minutes, 15. But the one who I used to understand, I think, has already understood. So, there are challenges that we have faced. First, the seminary was to offer adequate formation. And the adequate formation has always been adjusted to the changing times and the peoples. For example, today, all serious workers that head institutions are degree holders. And for secondary school head teachers, they must be master's degree holders. This challenge must come to us. We cannot no longer therefore say we are overbaked. When some people think that Gaba overbakes some people, they have too many, they were a degree holder in a village. But my dear friend, overbaking is no longer possible. Because the times are always changing. So are we able to meet the academic and social challenges with our education? You may find that we are failing to manage some issues because of attitudes we have from our formation. How many of our priests have failed to manage or failed to manage the corona pandemic? And why? How many of our priests fail to manage the political situations in their places? And why? And how many priests fail to manage the workers and the people they have, and why. Sometimes you find that this, this seminary has formed more dictators than Democrats. Why? What do you mean? 
So in some parishes, there are no pastoral, pastoral councils, or what do you call them? Parish pastoral council, what do you call it? Yeah, parish pastoral councils. Because the Bwana Mukuru is the one who says everything. He's the treasurer, he's the, he's the, he's the one who announces the decisions, he's the one who makes the decisions, he's the one who calls the shots, and so forth. So the challenge is, is our formation adequate, especially academic and social, to meet the challenges of our people. And there are occasions where we feel it is not. But on a happy note, yes. Because our community is one of the first, fastest growing, the Christian community is one of the fastest growing in the world. It means there are good people there doing a lot of good work. And the best contribution for me was from the Gaba Pastor Institute, which later relocated to Kenya. Because the priests who came from here were pastoral minded. And we would like to see that this pastoral mindedness gets revived and that there is a little more of democracy and listening by some of us. Because some challenges like Ebola and Corona will not we will we, we need uh, need to listen and adjust and do things with others. Two, prayer and liturgy. There are challenges that have come about. We have got born again preachers and their instruments. You may have a church with two people, but the whole, the whole village is filled with the sound of the music and all the little kids are running to the places. We have got the, the youth and the children who sometimes are left out of everything. So they are challenges, on the liturgy especially. So there are challenges, and what are we going to do? We are doing very well, but there are still challenges in there. Three, moral decadence out there, and sometimes it seems to come into us as well. Respect for the property of others, and also developing and enhancing the property of our people, of our parishes, taking care of our, the buildings, uh, the cows, the goats, and so forth. You may not need to run after the cows yourself, but you are still responsible, isn't it? Because you might not be able to run anymore. But there are people who are ready to run and you pay them a little bit, they will do what they enjoy and they will still report to you and do a good job. Yesterday they told me they caught a thief in the banana plantation of the parish. I said, yes, what, did, what happened? They said, we gave him a little something, but we did not, because you said that we should not do harm to people and kill anybody in the parish in the name of Christ. I said, you did right, that you did not kill him. But I hope the tea was not too much. <laughs> <laughs> then there is the respect for the daughters and wives of others. Some people feel that they can have two vocations. The celibate vocation and the uncelibate vocation. <laughs> then the respect for the liberty of others, the rights, their rights to say no, even somebody says I don't take alcohol. You find somebody trying to convince me, you are not a good man, why don't you take some alcohol? And sometimes I say, please, give me a break. Is this the gospel you are preaching to me? And then you say, eh? Father, I think you are a bit too serious. But why don't you respect my right? Why? And I have never understood why people really insist on some things to that extent. Maybe you have been, been faring better than I, but I get myself, myself, I said, is this, is, are these people formed before or the, after the French Revolution? where liberty, fraternity, and equality are what we should look at. Why do you want me to be under your will? And so, number, challenge number four, multi-party politics, but I think it has already been up there. Which principles do we front? find a priest 
is completely under a certain politician. He's ready to abuse, he's ready to destroy some things, he's ready to tell lies. And when you go to him, he says, no, this is... This. And when you go, you, he's telling people the other thing altogether. Is there no morality in politics? So, can there be something, maybe in the formation, towards something that it sometimes is quite annoying and discouraging because you feel somebody should do better. And there is a challenge of the, self, uh, the three selves, three selves of Henry Venn. Church, uh, building a church that is self-ministering, self-supporting, and self-propagating. Many of our communities are not yet self-supporting, and many times the problem is beginning with the leader. I have come to learn that leadership is everything. That is my slogan these days. Leadership is everything. If the people cannot be self-reliant, most likely it is because the leader is not allowing them to be self-reliant. Most important, uh, number five, unity and solidarity of priests, even in dioceses, is always under challenge. As Paul was saying, some people say, I'm for Paul, I'm for Apollos, and so forth. Why should this be still persisting at this time in history? So I would like to end that we have come to a time when we need to sharpen the tools. I brought somebody to speak to the members of the, the leaders of the Christian communities and he gave us a story that a man had a person going to cut trees or to bring, cut down trees. So the first day he cut down 10. He said, you felt strong. The second day, only 7. He said, oh. The other day, only 4. Uh -huh. The other day, only 1. Said, no, I have given up, it is too much. So he went to the person who had told me with the axe. Then he showed, he said, I'm giving up, I cannot go any further. Oh, the, the, the man said, okay, but before you go, let me first look at your axe. <laughs> the axe was blunt. So he said, let me fa them first sharpen it, and then you will go back. So they sharpened it. The next day he went, he cut 11. Said you are cutting too many. You will remain with the ten every day. <laughs> this is the time we should sharpen the axe. Maybe it's getting blunt, and we are putting a lot of effort, but we are not getting results. Can we sharpen the axe? And so the tools must be sharpened. And there is a call for some professionalism in looking at ourselves. Let us look for professionals to do an evaluation that will involve all the stakeholders, students, staff, products of the seminary, the Christians, the bishops, and so forth, maybe government officials, to evaluate us and ourselves so that we know that our weaknesses, our strengths, our opportunities, and so forth. Two, that we have our the goals, the vision, the goals, the objectives, and the time frame are all clearly set out. Like we read in some work of the prophets. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2. So that things are clear. Three, that we get clear sight plans. and we, The clear sight plan of this place will be put exactly where we need to put things so that we are not repeating things every time, as we do sometimes in our parishes over there. This place looks elegant, and I'm very happy to be here. And we make things more permanent. Four, that we set priorities, so that even when we are asking with ma for money, we, are, we have the priorities right. And we, want, we know exactly what to begin with, where we are going next, and so forth. I could say much more, but I think uh, the time I was given is already over. I want to thank you very much for listening to me. 
God bless Gaba Seminary. God bless the holder of the servant. God bless the future of the church. God bless Gaba. God bless. Thank you very much. Um, senior, you can stay a little bit. Ah. Normally, I was re I was ready to go because I'm already tired, but I'm ready. I well, can stay. <laughs> normally, when a presentation is good, people sit and clap. But when it's very good, they stand and clap while standing, and we call that a standing ovation. And the way what they are doing is how they feel about the presentation that you've made to us. Monsignor, thank you very much. And for, for its seat seminarians, as you know, we have a, an universal audience, which includes people with disabilities. They don't hear what you are, you're doing, but they can see you. Can we clap for the dis, those who can't hear? This is how they clap. All right, cameraman, can you capture that wave? Yes, so for all our friends out there, we salute you and we salute our presenter. Yeah. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Yes, um, you can see when Monsignor begins to speak from his experience of Gaba, you can see Gaba live. I don't know whether you saw it live. We have a few minutes. We're supposed to be going for a break according to our timetable. But as I said, this day is Gaba listens and Gaba speaks. I want to give a few opportunities to some of you to talk back, to respond. We have got some mind tickling thoughts from our keynote speaker, you remember? He left us some questions. And the presenter has highlighted some of the things that have happened in Igaba over years. How do you feel about them? As I said, we are being open, we are being familiar, but we are being objective and real because we want to move the next 50 years. And that's how we are going to go about it. What do you feel? I'm giving opportunity to a few, two, three people. Yes, I have Dr. Kaboya, Father Chimbo here. And I'm going to ask that, where are my aides with the microphone? I need someone to move with the microphone very fast. Assistance team. Mr. Sempa is here, and our vocations director. Mm -hmm. take that. So we, we shall come back in the next session. Number one, briefly tell us who you are because we are capturing you online. And be brief and the point. Thank you. I'm Father Charles Senyondo. I'm a teacher of dogmatic theology, which our presenter also is. He taught me dogma. Here. All right. I would like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Beautiful. Everything was touching. But mostly to me was what you said about sharpening our tools. That touched me more than the rest. And I would like you to know, I mean, to, uh, you to help me to identify which tools need sharpening and which tools can help us sharpen these tools. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being brief and dogmatic. Yes, from the chamber. You can speak from where you are. Thank you. Monsignor Silverio Twino and Father Emmanuel Ikimboa. When I was from Shwanjara, I went to Chisubi Seminary. And in Chisubi Seminary, our ultimate goal was to go to Katigondo. Instead, I didn't go there. I went to St. Timbaga, and from there, I continued God's ways. We used to see you anyway at St. Timberg, an elegant man here and all that. 
I'm happy that you are able to reproduce that picture of the cab of those days as you are young, elegant men, young men here to us today. But you have talked about many things that affected or that influenced or that you experienced uh, the politics and uh, the sports and so on. I wanted you to throw more light on the internal leadership here. When you talked of leadership here, you talked of an African lecture, but in the course of the years as seminarians here or as lecturers, vice lecturer of Dean of Studies, I wanted you to, to share something of your experience as regards electing students leaders in this seminar. Thank you. All right, you are going to move to Mr. Sempa. We are allowing you to speak from where you are. Thank you. My name is Robert Sempa. I am a former server Christ of Kampala Archdiocese. Thank you very much, Monsignor, for that wonderful presentation. There is one thing I want to comment on, and maybe you can throw more light on it. Uh, I am a grad I am a graduate of leadership. You talk so much about leadership and society, how leadership affects everything, how leadership causes the fall of everything, and how everything rotates around leadership. I think that was a very good point, which I wanted further to comment further on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Father, right here, and take this, and then we shall take a few of those. Uh, thank you, uh, MC. My name is Philip Lokel. I come from the Diocese of Cotido in Karamoja. I traveled the whole day yesterday to be personal present uh, in this uh, uh, function because I, I thought it was a very, very important function as, as we have all witnessed from the presentations uh, this morning. I've been, I have my own experience, of course. I've been a priest for over 30 years. <laughs> In fact, more than 36 years. There's a, so during this time, definitely when you are celebrating 36 years, yeah, yeah, you have shot your pastoral bullets. Some have landed on target, <laughs> others have not. <laughs> and I want to thank Father Silverio for his beautiful, beautiful presentation. I hope we shall all take note of the things he said. He also talked about Africanness, and uh, I did something in Bible about blacks. In the Bible, there is a lot, but all of which, uh, all those texts speak positively about blacks, about Africans. And of course, I don't have the material time to share with you those insights. Otherwise, we would be uh, till the chickens come to roost, <laughs> as they say. But allow me, uh, Mr. MC, Father MC. <laughs> maybe to contribute one or two things in line with what Father Monsignor Silverio was You're welcome. Sh sharing. You're welcome, as briefly as you can. You know, we are here for this function in the context of the Golden Jubilee celebrations. Now, it is usually customary to celebrate, as you know, 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, 100 years, and so on, as Jubilee years. And following the Levitical practice, these are usually years of restoration, reparation, and renewal. 
And so also in the context of the church, in the context of the seminary as a, a community. So this is a time, I think, for us to consider seriously those three things. Restoration, reparation, and renewal. In other words, when you reach the landmark of 50 years, and in the case of GABA, as Monsignor Sylvester rightly pointed out, I think it is no longer business as usual. Because you are thanking God for the first, celebrating the present, and looking forward to the future. So, in my view, the basic question really now for GABA, and indeed for us as church, is to ask ourselves the fundamental question. What is it in this great institution which requires restoration, reparation, and renewal? The previous speakers have clearly pointed out of the need to return to the roots, to the core values, or the raison d'etre of this, of this institution. And I tend to fully agree with them. But of late, uh, you know, the His Holiness Pope Francis has talked about clericalism. I want really to point this out as an addition to what uh, Monsignor Sylvester Silverio pointed out the issue of clericalism as <laughs> we look forward. And I'm glad the Pope gave a beautiful explanation of this. And he says that uh, he alludes to this in a, there is a new small booklet, I think the gift of priestly uh, for mention of occasion. And uh, let me just say, and he said that seminarians who are supposed to be formed in the spirit, are supposed to be formed in the spirit of the gospel and in an intimate relationship with, with the Lord. Because, but because of cleric clericalism, this has not always been the case. What we have in his state is now what he calls spiritual worldliness. And the Pope explains and says, this means obsession with personal appearances. One, a presumed theological or disciplinary certainty. Narcissism. Narcissism is when someone is too concerned about their appearance or abilities and spends too much time admiring those appearances. And, and uh, just one uh, minute, I, I, I am concluding. Okay, in the, the time is out, Father. Okay. Just some time. Okay, thank you. So, so that's the, I wanted to point out <laughs> and the last word and then I sit down. And he includes authority, authoritarianism, that's the, the urge to control others, and Father, so on and so forth. Well, Thank you. That you in light. Print, uh, for the purposes of this uh, convention, we are going to have a write up. So please, if you have some of those, yeah. can you present them to our panel? Uh, we are going to have them. On record. Okay, sorry. Sorry for Thank taking time. I, I want you, you see? to clap for Father <laughs> Philip because Thank he has you. traveled all <laughs> from Cotito to be here in person. I think that's the special spirit of St. Mary's. Thank you for being with us. And the timekeeper is not very, uh, is on my um, asking of the timekeeper is granting me. Um, time after lunch, we are going to have a general discussion of all this. And I'm asking before you forget, 
kindly, I saw some hands going up. Write down all these inputs or questions and bring them here at the table. We are going to give them to the panelists so that they can answer together and holistically. I think that's okay in the interest of time. I know we have a lot of ideas and inputs which can be done in the setting that we have. So kindly accept that. And Father, I think you've, Monsignor, you've taken note. We are going to be going for the break, but we are going to bring you back. And together with the other presenters, have another panel discussion after lunch. So please, members, before you go, please write note those uh, questions that you had and bring them to us. I hand you over to the MC. And thank you very much for attending actively this session. Thank you very much, our dear presenter and moderator. I would like to announce that we are halfway into the time of the break. So from here, we shall go for a break, a cup of tea, glass of water. We shall extend our second session by 15 minutes. So we shall come here at 11.45. 11.45. And when we come back here, I will ask the, the other presenters to take their seats on the other side and our other moderator to take his seat here. I will introduce the other members when we come back from the break. So we are going to the students' dining hall. That's where we shall have our break. So without wasting time, uh, we can move. And those of you who want to use the washrooms, they will be outside here. The students will direct you. The ladies may be allowed to use the offices. Sister Stella, you will help the ladies to show them your places. So let's have a break. Thank you. dear presenters to take their seats here and the uh, second moderator Professor Bagire kindly take your seat here on my side allow me before we begin the second session to introduce to you a few 
individuals. I will begin with our Monsignor John Baptist Kauta, the Secretary General to the Uganda Episcopal Conference. Monsignor, please stand up for recognition and most welcome. So that is our Monsignor Kauta. From the Catholic Secretariat, we have Father Fred Tsinjire, who is the Director of Lay Apostolate at the Catholic Secretariat. We have Father Benedict Birunji, the Chaplain of KIU, Kampala, University, Kampala International University. We have the representative of the Opus Dei, Reverend Father Alex Mbonimpa. Most welcome. We have the Vice Rector of St. Paul's National Major Seminary, Nyamaska, Reverend Father Francis Lubanga. Most welcome. And the Dean of Studies, Nyamaska, Father John Baptist Chugundu. I think it's still for a break. Uh, our good presenter, Monsignor Philip Lokel, is he back? Yes, Monsignor Philip Lokel is the Vicar General of Cotido and uh, Vocations Director at the same time and the former formator here at Gaba Seminary. And last but not least, we have the Vocations Director of Moroto Diocese, Father Simon Peter Lokiru. Uh, we have also the Vocations Director of Tororo Archdiocese. Uh, the names I forgot. Yes, we shall get the names. Welcome. So I ask the presenters, please, if you are here, maybe I mention the names. Our beloved professor, Father Dr. Joseph Buchana Chisoga. If you are around, please take your seat the other side. Um, Mr. Matega Antone, kindly take your seat the other side. And we have our second moderator of today, Professor Bagire. And now allow me to invite once again our Reverend Father Dr. Sebunya to introduce and invite the second presenter to begin. Our timetable has been adjusted a little bit. We are beginning at 11.45. We're already five minutes in the presentation. Up to 12.30 will be the, the second presenter. Then he will have 15 minutes of discussion. This will take us up to a quarter to one, and we shall have an extra 15 minutes for the previous discussion, which we didn't complete. That will take us to 1 p.m., and I will announce what follows after one. So, nice attendance. Thank you once again, our MC, and welcome back, everybody, from our well-deserved health break. I hope it was nice and refreshing. As you told, we have in front of us cameras. One is rolling from Catholics Online. The other one is from Uganda Catholic Television. Maybe some of us don't know, now that Father Philip is here, that we have a Catholic TV channel which can be accessed on YouTube. Just go YouTube, UCTV. You're going to view whatever is happening here, live and even beyond. Thank you, Father Philip, and the Communications Department of the Episcopal Conference. And I once again thank our previous presenter. I want to go with the rector's punchline. Remember the past with gratitude. We live the present with enthusiasm and look to the future with hope. Father uh, Monsignor has helped us to experience the past, the glory, and the challenges of our past 50 years. But are we going to bask in that past glory and celebrate? Someone has said, the past is a stepping stone, not a millstone. You need to do more. Look at your past, get energy to go forward. Our next topic is going to help us to reflect on what we are going to do as we move into the next 50 years of St. Mary's. And the title you have is Situational Analysis, Dynamic Social Reality, 
and paradigm shift in priestly formation. And to lead us into this discussion, in this session, is another great son of St. Mary's. His profile is like 15 pages long, and I won't dare to read it as it should, but I just want to summarize it in three words. That our presenter is a priest, an academician, and an administrator. As a priest, he was born in 1962, just about when Uganda was being born. After his A-level, he joined the Katigondo in 1986 for philosophy, and later in 1989, joined this great institution of St. Mary's Gaba for theology. He was ordained priest of Ginger Diocese on 1st August 1992. And we want to congratulate you, Father, for completing 30 years of solid, faithful service in the church. He served as a lecturer and formator in St. Paul's Seminary, Chinyamaska. As an administrator, our presenter was the Director of Research and Dean of Studies at Chinyamaska Seminary for a couple of years. He later became the Coordinator and Assistant Registrar of Uganda Matters University, Mbale Campus, and currently is the Academic Registrar. Those who know what that means. Academic Registrar of Uganda Matters University, Nkosi. As an academic and academician, our presenter has many academic accolades and publications. He holds diplomas in philosophy and theology from Katigond and Gaba. He holds the Bachelor of Philosophy and Theology from Urban University in Rome, as well as a Master's and a PhD in Dogmatic Theology from the same Urban University of Rome. He successfully defended and published his doctoral thesis in, in 2001 under the title Conversion of Churches as the Dialogue Reference for the Ecumenical Unity of Christians in Uganda. From the many publications and articles, I can sense that this thesis has been a springboard for many papers, articles, contributions, and to journals and books, as well as his lectures, including public lectures like this. He holds a master's degree in developmental studies from Uganda Matters University in Kozi. As you will see, he has a special passion for research. Someone was asking for the tools to sharpen. I think that's one tool to sharpen as leaders. Research. Social research and what's happening. And Father here has got a good experience of research and social issues as well as academic issues. He has directed over 120 diploma research papers, 550 master's research papers, 125 Bachelor of Arts research papers, and seven PhD dissertations. Today's topic is a fruit of this wide exposure in research and pastoral experience as a priest and formator. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome in your midst Reverend Father Dr. Joseph Buchana Chisoga. Most welcome. As we told, he's a, an experienced lecturer. He's going to use the 45 minutes, and then we shall be responding and communicating. So meanwhile, write them down. He, he's a researcher, and he can compile all the themes. So that at the end, we shall bring them the results. Thank you very much, man. Man, you have destroyed me. <laughs> First, the maestro, and next the pupil. Father Silverio is my teacher. He's my maestro. He taught me dogmatic theology. Your Lordship, Bishop Muhirwa, Monsignor Kauta, Secretary General, Director of Gaba and the staff, 
rectors of sister seminaries and staff, my fellow guests who include my boss, the vice chair of the governing council, Uganda Matters University, Professor Bagire, so I have to behave here. My dear seminarians, ladies and gentlemen, according to the invitation card I received, my session was to run for an hour and a half, and as such, I prepared. <laughs> Now the man is telling me that I have to do writing for the five minutes. We shall do what will be possible. Dear people of God, the topic I was given was situational analysis, dynamic social reality, and paradigm shift in priestly formation. I say it was because I had adjusted it and added in Uganda. Because if you leave a topic open-ended, then you risk expectations which you cannot provide for. <laughs> we are talking about dynamic social reality as the independent variable and that which becomes of the priest or the seminarian as the dependent variable. To reason around this topic, by the way, before I go any further, I promise that this presentation is going to be a bit boring, especially at the beginning. This topic is not self-explanatory. Dynamic social reality and paradigm shift in priest reformation are not a detailing of situational analysis. Instead, situational analysis relates to dynamic social reality and paradigm shift in priest reformation as the function being applied to, that is, making a situation analysis of dynamic social reality, and then how that calls for a paradigm shift in priestly formation. Implied in this engagement is the understanding that if a situation calls for a paradigm shift, then all is not well. Why would you substitute a winning team? Why would you change a strategy? that works well. So you can see bias beforehand in this presentation. It's not a, more, a mere explorative endeavor, but a descriptive and analytical one. In other words, my analysis is quite a half statement of the problem on priest reformation. And that is to say, I focus more on what is as opposed to what ought to be. Because that is where the search for paradigm shift may have to start from. In explicating this subject, a number of questions will guide, and these include, what exactly is the current social reality? How dynamic is that reality? Who or what are the agents of this dynamism? Are seminarians and priests simply innocent and unsuspecting victims of this dynamism? Or rather, can they be unresolved weaklings and cowards being unable to surmount the ambiguities in the reality around them so as to minister to them and instead serve those ambiguities without ministering to them, obeying them without questioning them. In other words, can they instead 
the agents of that dynamism too. And what is the influence, even impact, of these realities on the seminarian and later priest? How then ought priestly formation to respond to this dynamism? Is a paradigm shift in priestly formation possible in the prevailing circumstances? These questions are too many and too big to be meaningfully addressed in a single paper like this one. However, they provide the spectrum within which the discourse will be shaped. The dynamism of, re of social reality can be examined from two perspectives. The first perspective is the one regarding how rapidly social realities are changing in terms of people's perspectives and actions, guided by new demands and expectations. And this creates a series of instances and calls for an equally rapid response so as to catch up with the times. Evangelizing by the use of social media is one such instance. Since service of God is also service of humanity, and humanity can only be served relevantly, service of God calls for relevance. And I do believe this is a significant locus of priestly formation already being addressed, perhaps needing more and more observation, listening, and creativity. The second perspective, and my main concern here, is the impact of social dynamism on the state of life of the priests and the seminarians, which leads us to problematize on the nature, state, and environment of priestly formation. Whether a solution can easily be got by changing paradigms is another matter, given that we are dealing with human realities. In any case, any purposeful, systematic, and methodic cure will start with an examination of the symptoms of a phenomenon and the corresponding diagnosis thereof if any meaningful prescription is to be attempted. Remember, I promise to be boring. There is no doubt that the priest of today is a product of his age, a contemporary world which has become more critical of religious values and principles. Indeed, the 21st century can be regarded as the dawn of the new age, which was witnessed which has witnessed new descriptions and definitions of life in many ways, from traditional and orthodox understanding. These are expressed in the forms of new doctrines, morality, ethics, and values. Precisely, we are experiencing a new psychology, sociology, and pedagogy, and these are rooted in the new visions of sexuality, and intricate ideology of human origin, existence and meaning, new crusades on freedom from religion, not freedom of religion. As it were, these new convoluted ways of seeing the world anew are being propagated by influential and wealthy personalities and institutions that allow a warm appeal to these doctrines and understandings with such high-profile ascent on the, these new doctrines, there is a towering attack on orthodox and traditional teachings of the church. Such challenges have had a penetrating influence on priestly ministry. The twin ideologies of secularism and relativism have posed formidable threats to the continued relevance of the priest in society. Relativism is a subjective way 
of approaching, viewing, analyzing, expressing, evaluating, and judging things, including the human person. Social cultural relativism promotes evil, personalizing, and subjectivizing diverse cases of life because it proposes that each has its unique morality. Thus, each culture and person has texts which determine codes of moral, of moral behavior for it. The case of objectivity or general acceptability of moral responsibility is squashed. This deceptive trend tends to promote materialism as the doctrine because of its subjective tendencies. These phenomena again raise questions and queries and query the authenticity of priestly formation in contemporary society. Hitherto, the priest enjoyed high-level clericalism and elitism in society. This can be argued to be the spin-off of the ecclesiastical hegemony and religious dominance from the Middle Ages. While its effects had whittled down in some parts of the world, particularly Europe and America, in Africa, the priest largely still enjoys a pride of place. Nevertheless, the whirlwind of secularism and relativism is so fast thickening that the priest's moral authority no longer rests on the institution of the church alone. But rather, additionally, he needs to justify the institution and the call he professes by the way of life and pastoral roles. It is a truism that priestly life demands honesty, integrity, and heroic self-sacrifice. But without proper discernment in the world of change, this might turn out to be a platonic adventure. Frederick Nietzsche's popular phrase that religion makes people docile and timid in the face of suffering and oppression is now fast becoming untenable, as well as that of Mark, uh, Karl Marx, that religion is the opium of the people. It is amazing that these challenges extend to the places where vocations to the priesthood are nurtured, the seminary and our parishes. Based on this reality, the church is struggling to deal with the increasing rate of change and expectation of the priestly ministry. In the words of Benedict the XVI, how much filth there is in the church and even among those who in the priesthood ought to belong entirely to him. This situation of paradox raises the question of the authenticity of priestly formation in the light of today's changing society. Moreover, it leaves a major challenge to the vocation. Arguably, there is the conflict of seeing the priest ministry, the priest ministry as a profession or occupation rather than a vocation. In the exercise of the priestly ministry today, some trends leave a lot of people to question the authenticity of their vocation, or at least the authenticity of their priestly formation. Some of these trends are highly opposed to what constitutes the tenets, the doctrines, and the teachings of the church, especially in the areas of worship, ethics, and morality concerning life, marriage, sex, and gender. The new trends which raise the questions of authenticity of priestly vocation and formation are enormous. Although we can say that the major concerns of these oscillate around the celebration of the church liturgy, preaching of the word, living priestly life, and the practice of pure charity and love. The social reality. 
As humans, we live in a context that is filled with interactions which generate realities and experiences, both personal and interpersonal. So as we interact, we are both recipients and donors of interpersonality discharges in our social encounters. This is what social reality is about. Society used to be defined in terms of concreteness of boundaries and strict closeness of people and defined backgrounds and destinies. That is, a group of individuals involved in persistent social interaction or a large social group sharing the same spatial or social territory, typically subject to the same political authority and dominant cultural expectations. These days, the stretch of aggregation among people is very elastic and defies territoriality. Talking about social reality or social phenomena points to expressions which include the political climate and practices, economic production, consumption, consumerism and inequalities, economic crisis factors which drastically alter the way in which people interact commercially and have a profound impact on their emotionality. Others are avarice, exoduses of people and immigrations, refugees, art and fashion, a very high cost of living, rampant murders, child sacrifice, land grabbing, corruption, degradation of life and human values, technological outburst, permissiveness and delinquency, drunkenness and drug abuse, abuse of religion and people's trust. There are also the social networks, a phenomenon of recent years whereby through the internet, through the internet, people communicate and share content more easily, even thousands of kilometers away. This is also the content of what is otherwise referred to as social dynamics. This social reality changes slowly or rapidly depending on many factors. This gives rise to the phenomenon of dynamism. Shalamwana, a Congolese musician, exemplified social expectations in relation to personal transformation. In 1996, she visited Uganda, and one of the places she went to to perform was Gava Beach, just behind here. And while there, she announced that she was single and searching. But she gave the following conditions. If you are not handsome at 20, strong at 30, rich at 40, wise at 50, do not bother. The implication is that social reality is so diverse that one should be able to fit somewhere. In my language, they say, no munafu tabula kucha sobola. Even a, a weakling, a lazy person, will have something that they can handle. You know? You ought not to be a total good for nothing in everything. You surely know the story of St. John Mary Vianney and how, so to speak, he was dense in class and was to be sent away a number of times. It came to a moment when he really had to go. When the rector calls him and tells him, 
you pack up and you go. But you also know that it is said in the Bible that Samson slayed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. So in his fury, the rector says, John Mary Vianney, you are a complete ass. And John Mary Vianney says, Mon Pearl, Father, if Samson could slay a thousand Philistines with just the jawbone of an ass, consider what God could accomplish with a complete ass. The rest of the story we know and how wonderful John Mary Vianney was. Not in class in academics, but in pastoral. You cannot be a complete good for nothing in everything. Heraclitus describes the cosmos as being in a constant, a constant state of flux, always becoming. Everything is constantly changing and becoming other things to what it was prior to that state. This is objective philosophical knowledge of the world, which is in consonance with the scientific description of the physical and human realities. The priest, being part of nature, reacts and responds to its natural changing environment, mirroring this from the context of incredibly changing issues in the church there is a need for skilled and well-formed and informed priests to carry out the mission of the church. Is the change out there so fast but that by the end of four years here, a person is already outdated? Is such formation possible that would take care of such a speed? Because then, it would have to focus only on the far, and not even near future, not to talk of the present. Problematization. In considering how to ensure the well-being of citizens in the public policy process, a distinction is made between a condition and a problem. A condition is a state that one can only bear without the possibility of doing anything about it. Before Dr. Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, polio was a trauma just to be feared or born. Now it is a problem, a solvable one, and the governments only have to apply themselves to eliminate it. The darkness in our dark continent was formerly a natural to endure. With the discovery of electricity, concentration can even be put on rural electrification in order to solve that darkness problem. COVID-19 was immediately translated into a problem and many efforts were applied towards that even though we lost very many people. Thank God Ebola is turning into a problem that can be solved because it is beginning to appear that recovery from it is possible. All this implies that in the church we need to problematize on the nature, state, and environment of priestly formation. Whether a solution can easily be got by changing paradigms, as I said already, is another matter. So actually, what is our problem? What is the problem? Jesus says, if a blind man leads another blind man, you know what happens. You can be a wounded healer, all right, but you cannot be a dead healer. That would be pretentious. The Vasoga say, Naviranga or Tinomutualume or Muiga. 
Wamutu Alme is a man who has ever married but now has no wife, has not yet remarried. But he is the same man selling herbs to other men to enable them to get, get wives. That one is a pretender in Abiyamanga. There are some vices which are sadly notable even among the seminarians and the priests. Tribalism, theft, ritual murders, malice, struggle for positions to the extent of murdering real or imagined enemies, character assassination, syncretism expressed in terms of sorcery and night dancing, witchcraft, both among those who do it and those who allege it as the first explanation of their mishap. Because if your first explanation of your sickness, of your misfortune is witchcraft, then you believe in witchcraft also. The use of talisman to secure one's office, perhaps also among formators in major seminaries, except those who are here. <laughs> Devil worship, corruption, drunkenness, homosexuality, utter irresponsibility, and combativeness, among others. These phenomena are so reckless, so intense, so rampant, and so heartless, that they by far transcend mere human failure. They portray an attitude that has come to the realization that God is dead after all. Yet, the general quantitative state of vocations to the priesthood in Uganda is not bleak. If anything, it is promising. There has been talk of building a fifth national seminary. When I came here about a year ago, I found out that there was a house in nine. I never left it here. Actually, that is where I slept. And I asked, when was it constructed? Of course, I could not ask, why was it constructed? For fear of, of uh, an answer, in the way the Germans would answer, do me frage, silly question. When I went to Kinyamaska last month, I did not only find a new reality in the form of the old chapel turned into a beautiful looking dormitory, but also a new yet to be completed dormitory. These days you read about bumper harvest in some dioceses ordaining tens of deacons to the priesthood at a go. This is indeed an encouraging picture. And that is why these dormitories are being constructed. St. Imbaga here used to be a diocesan seminary. It later by default became regional. And now it is quasi-national. Quantitatively, therefore, we project a reassuring and admirable picture of vocations to the priesthood. The major headaches are two. How to manage the numbers that come, both in the seminary environment and in the field. It is possible to be boastful of both quantity and quality. Is this the case in Uganda? We are living in the dispensation of Christ and the role of the priest is to reenact and further that dispensation. As a dispenser, therefore, he has to carry something in and with him. This is relevant because of the adage, name or that, God non habit. You cannot give what you don't have. Invariably, the question is, how can priests be adequately relevant 
in a world of constant change. It is crystal clear that society is undergoing changes through science and technological development, as we have noted above. Now, I would like to look, I skip something, and I look at what I'm calling disturbing realities in the priesthood. We are doing a situational analysis. The Italians say, I translate, one falling tree makes a lot more noise than the entire forest that is growing. Fine. But is ours just a falling tree or a really both noisy and smoldering menace? Jesus says, um, no, that one. One time, you know, I was the first um, coordinator of pastoral activities in St. Paul's National Seminary. And uh, I was also training the deacons to be and the deacons in the practice of sacraments. So this was the sacrament of reconciliation. We are practicing. So two people would go in the front. One is the, the confessor, the other one is there. And then after they would exchange roles, and then you confess loudly. After all, it is a fake conf confession. And then the other one also counsels loudly. In one of the cases, the penitent said, I stole the saucepans of the parish. And uh, like you are laughing, we all laughed, including myself. It was funny, fine. Then later, a seminarian comes to me and asks me, do you know why everybody laughed? I said, I guess so. I also laughed. It was funny. He said, yes, it was funny. But that was not all. People laughed because in his case, it could as well be true. <laughs> <laughs> While every year in Uganda, Many young men had ordained the Catholic priesthood. Within the first five years of ordination, a certain percentage of those men fall into vocational crisis. A problem with alcohol, disorientation, disappointed with a life that was not of their imagining, or they just convinced themselves they need to take some time off. Some end up being sent for counseling. Some of them have ended up requesting a return to the lay state. For the parishioners they served, for the classmates, their pre-spirit, and obviously for themselves, such outcomes can be shocking and devastating. Relatedly, we have the current trend of some priests being projects gone bad or being mistakes. And this is worrying. A priest, about one year only, becomes tired and retired. Is that pre existent priesthood and humanity, which by the time of birth is already very old? The magnitude of cynicism is pathetic. Nothing seems to make sense. Everything becomes questionable. People do not know what to do with themselves. And how can they know what to do with others? There is nothing as disgusting and underwhelming as a young person who is without expression, 
zeal, ambition, life, then you are truly a mistake. But how can mistakes be, mistakes be so frequent in such a noble project? How did we get there? It is true we live in a quite provocative environment. But what does it call for if not understanding, patience, and coolness? And many times, mere reasoning. Often you hear of a reactionary lot of priests and religious without any iota of control. And you wonder if what they went through can be called formation. One time, a priest was celebrating Christmas Eve, and you know how chaotic that one can be. You have so many drunkards outside there, and they are making noise. And uh, when he said, the Lord be with you, and one drunkard outside there replied, and with your mother. <laughs> you needed to see that that was the end of mass for this priest. The agitation he was in, the hurry he was in, and as soon as he blessed, rushed to the sacristy. Just threw off the vestment to go raging looking for that old man. <laughs> and indeed, when he got him, he, he showered him with blows. But come to think about it, the Lord be with you, the Lord be also with your mother. What's wrong with that? <laughs> what, what is it? <laughs> so, the drunkard got a bidding for blessing the priest's mother. <laughs> the impression is so strong that by the time some seminarians are ordained the priests, they have already gone bad. They have already divorced. They are like couples, which by the time they are wedding, they have already divorced. This explains why some of them cheat on one another during honeymoon. A seminarian who divorces even before he is ordained, what is his conception of the priesthood? Do we perhaps have a problem here. You have a person who comes out as a priest, but immediately cannot stand community life and begins doing all sorts of funny things, being self-centered and making unrealistic demands. Some would complain about everything and about everybody except themselves when actually they are the real problem. And because you cannot run away from your shadow, wherever they are taken, the same reality surfaces. There is a big concern over the embrace of institutionalism versus internalization at a personal level, producing mere churchmen as opposed to authentic, humble servant leaders. Some people have alleged that Christ preached the kingdom and the church came out meaning that the church is an unintended wrong outcome. While this interpretation is unrealistic, wrong, sarcastic, and pretentious, there is a way it speaks to our behavior in reality. When Mahatma Gandhi says, I respect Christ, but I despise Christians, what does he mean? We shamelessly hide behind institutions. One time I went to Hoima with a motorcycle. It rained very, very much. On coming back, a classmate of mine asked to come with me to Fort Porto. We came riding, falling on our motorcycle. Somewhere we were at fault. I don't remember exactly how. And we were stopped by the traffic man. The first thing my friend said, going to them, we are priests. I felt that... The, uh, I should simply disappear from there, but my friend was, we are priests. You are at fault. You are a priest. One time, 
while in Miss Joachim entering the chapel, there were so many of us. People went talking. Some of us were in front and we are signaling to them, shh, keep quiet, we are entering the chapel. And somebody said, we are priests. Then shame on you if you are priests. One time, an elderly priest was driving a DMC. A traffic lady sees him coming. It's clear the car is a DMC. Stops him. He's very well dressed. The car is a DMC in dangerous mechanical condition. The tires are worn off. Just for the license, expired long ago. Just for the driving permit, it expired long ago. So this lady looks at this man, not knowing where to start from, and simply says, <laughs> And then another one is driving as at a roundabout, and he's doing all those funny manipulations like this. And then the taxi driver shouts at him, Father! <laughs> Masking has never gone away, and I don't think it is about to go away. Masking. They used to talk of levels of mas masking up to alloy. That, that one has an alloy mask, imp impenetrable. The people are in the seminary. And all they are doing is to hide. That which you are hiding means you are not sure of it yourself. And there is nothing as disgusting as having an elderly man or woman masking. That means you have lived all your life simply masking. And you have crystallized into absurdity. Lack of transparency. The bishop, as we all understand, has the duty and therefore the right to know the man he is ordaining. Bishops in general rely on the evaluation of candidates to the priesthood provided to them by the seminary formation team led by the rector. And today's seminarian understands well that appropriate self-disclosure is a key ingredient to a healthy and happy life no matter what one's vocation. There is no friendship no love, no genuine connection with others, no emotional intimacy without vulnerability. But seminarians know that they are in a, a bow of source. There is an environment of constant evaluation. Trust is difficult. Transparency in the formation environment obviously carries with it risks. The seminar formators are human instruments with their own weaknesses and imperfections. To open up to a formator being one who's with one's own imperfections, talking about a struggle, sharing about one's own weaknesses, opening oneself to advice and guidance, it all carries the risk of being hurt somehow. Will the formator really understand Will what I'm sharing about myself somehow get misunderstood, misconstrued, or exaggerated? Or is it that I fear being forced to look squarely at a real and ongoing area of struggle in my life? Something that in fact might append the dream of priesthood. This man who disorganized me from the beginning is continuing, so I need to skip uh, certain things. We have a very big problem. Very big problem of the inside and outside of the house. The formators can do their best here. But how about when the seminarians go out of here? Counterproductive influence of the parish and diocesan priests on the seminarian. 
one of the greatest challenges of formators is to, is to face the questions of students regarding the difference between what is taught in the seminary and the lifestyle of certain priests they encounter in the parishes. Whom are they going to believe? O panga bapangulula. It's unfortunate what is taught in the seminary is often referred to as a theory. That theory does not work. So you go out where you meet people who look like they have never been formed here. They have distorted everything. And that is more credible because it is practical. So a practical error is preferable to a theoretical truth. And that is very sad. And it confuses Sumerians. And I can assure you, you can talk all the angelic words here. But the reality they see, that is their reality. And unfortunately, it has a corrupting efficacy that some even long for it. When am I going to get there? And uh, that goes together with the, all the errors, all the errors that are made. One funny WhatsApp message said, if you want to change the world, do it while you are still single. Once you marry, you can not even change the TV channel. Likewise, if you want priests who will be ever self-conscious of who they are, make them now. But there is another reality. How is that going to be? Seminarians are taught logic. And by the time they are ordained, most of them have degrees in philosophy. But make a mistake of applying logic to a priest in the field. They will kill you. What has gone wrong? But they hold a degree. Your philosophy is Lugesi Gesi. In the university where I work, the students we teach ethics are the very ones we catch cheating examinations. We are taught in the seminary how to celebrate the liturgy. There is even a booklet called How Not to Say Mass. To celebrate liturgy in the ideal way, we go out and follow those who have distorted it. So everything we are taught is simple ideal, is a theory. Does not correspond to the reality on the ground. Did Jesus not do what he taught? Are distortions the ones which are practical? Is there no ideal of life? Is it distortions which are realistic? And this is quite a disturbing situation. I want to talk about what I'm calling intellectual mediocrity and the need for intellectual conversion in both the seminarians and the formators. We humans are intelligent beings whose worldviews are largely determined and guided by the mindsets of understanding and concepts. These mindsets are the openings by which we grasp the realities that are knowable through a series of experiential reasoning. They avail to us the matrices of knowledge that are reachable by the mind within a given set of horizons that surround us. At the same time, these mindsets are our limitations in so far as they set the possibilities and the range of knowing and understanding. We also know that our intellect has knowing at, as its formal object. This is what makes us curious and inspirational. It's also what makes us gospers, by the way. Intellectual growth goes along with the curiosity to explore, to discover, to create. If this natural path is not followed, one may find oneself slipping into illiteracy and intellectuality and ipso facto vulnerable, naive, and gullible. And that is related to descent into semi-illiteracy. 
You have seminarians who, as soon as they get home after completing their studies here, burn all the literature they had. That already makes them tend towards illiteracy with their degrees. Going beyond the formal and obvious meaning of knowing, of uh, knowing to read and write, illiteracy can be marked by a lack of acquaintance with the fundamentals of particular issues and errors that you might be dealing with in life. Factual, civic, perception, physical, mental, translative, argumentative, moral, and environmental, among others. These are people who will not read even a newspaper. The stage is set for annoying dictatorial ignorance, naivety, and outdatedness. How can it not be if you fail to update yourself? We do not have a reading culture, much less a writing one. A practice that would keep one on the tenterhooks of reflecting in order not to become prey to any cheap detractor. The doctrine we study is serviced not only with the practice of life, but also by further research and appreciation for appreciation. Little wonder then that some people, even priests, are easily turning into religious bats. When a politician leaves one party and joins another, you hear all kinds of names being applied to that person, as if a political party were a marriage or a religion. Now what shall we say about priests who keep jumping here and there, who give the impression that they received nothing to stand for so they can fall for anything? And we are talking about doctrine. These are the ones I'm calling religious bats and scandalous ones at that. St. Augustine moved a lot through pagan doctrines until he arrived at the real thing. So he will say, late have I known you, late have I loved you. But as we know, he really loved him. But how can someone who has been schooled in catechism, in the tradition of the church, in scripture and theology, be so easily uprooted. We saw this about two decades ago in Kanungu, where the tail wagged the dog. We are seeing it now at an even higher rate with the oak of memory and other confused deformations. And you can be sure there are those who simply have not yet manifested it. But inwardly, they are already uprooted. All these things cause doubts among people and society and lead to serious questions. They also provide material for our detractors to get capital out of. But the seminarians are supposed to get edif edification in academic rigor from their formators. And I want to argue that as formators, we fail them in this aspect. You have, have you ever experienced what happens when a breakdown breaks down? Professors need to, to, to be producers as they apply theological principles to provide relevant strategies to bothering questions and situations. For instance, why do people leave the Catholic Church? Are you preparing people to become priests in an empty church? That is your direct concern. Why do we preach endlessly, but people do not seem to change by that preaching? These and the many questions posed above need to be delved into by the seminary professors. Seminarians can be made to participate in these researches, and then we have co-publications between them and the professors. Why? Because prosperity is about change. Transcendence is about concentration and effort involving a change of attitude. Priestly formation is about the right disposition in line with the discernment and docility to listen. 
In a way, it is about self-violation. It is radical change. How can you help anyone to transform if you cannot even change your mind and attitude? Just like universities ought to be engines of research for social transformation, so ought sem the seminaries to become centers of theological excellence and relevance. What we have, I'm sorry to say, are professors who read others and prepare their lecture notes. And the seminarians who labor to cram what has been passed on to them. Our professors of theology, and I've been one of them, teach fundamental theology in the major seminaries using notes which were prepared by a team of Bible and theology professors of Kachevere Major Seminary in Malawi way back in 1974. And that's what we are still teaching. What is in there is a very important matter. It's true. You may not change it, but how many years down the road are these? How much change has taken place, even pedagogically alone? And that is only one of six volumes that they prepared, covering the entire salvation journey from revelation to eschatology. How many Bible and theology professors have we had in Uganda over the last, say, 50 years? But on the other hand, maximum productivity must be aided. It does not simply flow naturally. The apostles say, it is not good for us to leave the preaching of the word and resort to distributing food. The apostles were not themselves to starve or shun serving others while they still spent time looking for their own well-being. It must have meant that they too would be beneficiaries of the same service of the deacon. Just like a seminarian or priest can be in the chapel supposedly meditating when actually there is a marketplace in his head, so also can a, 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 a formator be here in the quiet of this place when the heart is full of tribulation. How do you expect him to offer beyond regurgitation? Social change has exposed the priests and religious to sharing unfavorably in the problems of their families and society at large. Education is expensive, and yet it is the order of the day. Many priests struggle with their close relatives in matters of education and health, among others. And as you are contemplating ignoring your relatives, you remember those times that you have seen a fellow priest ailing, practically neglected by the, by the diocese, and is being looked after by a relative. Then you surrender. You continue with the Lord. When the bishops are pleaded to regarding the financial plight of formators, they simply rebut, saying, you are better off than your brothers in the parishes. But for heaven's sake, I am in the university now, and there is a way things go. Don't compare me to somebody who is in the parish. If you want me to settle and do research, that cannot just be because uh, uh, Father Rinda is providing me with food. That's not enough. The result is that you cannot have satisfactory productivity. What I understood by the situation analysis analyzing the situation as it is, what is. Have you ever heard of what they call the nothing people? Some of us are nothing people. I came across this poem written some decades ago entitled The Nothing People. They will not rock the boat, but did you ever see them pull an oar? They will not pull you down. They will simply let you pull them up and let that pull you down. They do not hurt you. They merely will not help you. They do not hate you. 
they merely cannot love you. They will not burn you. They will just fiddle while you burn. They are the nothing people. They do not lie. They just neglect to tell the truth. They do not take. They simply cannot bring themselves to give. They do not steal. They scavenge. The sins of omission folk, they're neither good nor bad and therefore worse. Because the good at least keep busy trying and the bad try just as hard. Both have that character that comes from caring, action, and conviction. So give me every time an honest sinner or even a saint. But God and Satan, please get together and protect me from the nothing people. Let me skip because uh, I'm sure the man is... Uh, let me skip and go to <coughs> what I'm calling some prospects. Some prospects. It would be pretentious to say here is the new paradigm of seminar of priesthood formation. To be pretentious. By, he, by, by hitting on here and there and there, in a way something takes form. Here are some prospects, but which cannot be said to constitute paradigm shift. Would one be off the mark to speculate that our combined handling of the seminarians, especially at the lower level, makes them lose self-esteem and reduces them to mere survivors and therefore later on substantial burdens? Is it probably not time to examine our approach to bringing up priests to be Considering them as children in a family and encouraging them to share open land freely without them being suspicious and apprehensive that they are committing suicide by doing so. I saw recently on social media three girls all impregnated by a houseboy. Three daughters, all impregnated by a houseboy because the parents treated them like prisoners. They were not allowed to get out. And if they are not allowed to get out, all they have in there is Chiba Oshimala. In education in general, we are now talking about new pedagogies in learning, more sharing than simply banking. Confirm Paulo Freire in the book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Role playing, midwifery, confirm Socrates. And I would like to argue that we have a generation that is generally devoid of confidence, proper ambition, and fairness. There is a lot of try and error, gambling and mediocrity. At home in the earlier years, some are jet pushed to the professional desires of their parents. I have had two occasions to struggle with young men in their late 20s to persuade them to leave the seminary. After making it clear to me that they were struggling with the vocations of their mothers. Even worse than that, I made friendship with a priest from one of the countries in Africa. He was such a man whose tongue had little control of itself because only after days he told me that he was leaving the vocation of his mother. He was waiting for his mother to die so that he would get liberated like the platonic soul after the corruption of the body. He could not be the killer of his mother. That's why he was there, to save his mother. And the mother of all shocks to me was that on going back to his country after completing his studies, 
He was made director of a major seminary. Based on the above discussion, it emerges that there is a need for an approach to formation that can cause phenomenal change in young people's lives, resulting in the social transformation of their entire life in areas like enhancing their confidence, creating awareness about their value in society, and enhancing self-esteem and self-efficacy, among others. Conceptualizations and models of priestly formation have been oversimplified and focused on a hanging spiritual dimension not anchored in balanced personality. This parallels the mente sana in corpo sano dictum. The spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius are important. All right. Meditation is important. All right. The liturgy of the hours is important. All right. Visitation to the Blessed Sacrament just before lunch is important. All right. And of course, the Mass. All right. But they can remain mere superimpositions. Plenty of rain falling on a rock because there is no disposition there unto. St. Augustine tells us that grace builds on nature. And you can add. Nature. Families and society put a lot of wrong ideas in young people. Does our formation promote and create confident people? People who know that they are free, empowered, with the capacity to be many things, and therefore have expect a spectrum of choices around which they can make contributions to themselves, their family, and the entire society without seeing that they have been bewitched to the priesthood and so must do whatever it wrongly takes to get there. When, my, when, I, when I told my mother I wanted to go to the seminary, she said, no. And I said within myself, I will go and for the rest, you will sort yourself out. And that's what I did. And it was up to her to convert, not me. That's why I cannot understand that a man of 28 years tells you his vocation is that of his mother. What kind of fake man are you? You know? I have always been very sickly. Now I'm a lot better. When I was in the seminary, I was very, very, very sickly. I went for pastoral spiritual year. <laughs> the same thing continued. Now our year is when we started getting three recommendations coming to the theologicum from the parish, from the vocation director, and from the bishop. The one from the parish was very good except illness. The one from the vocation director was very good except illness. Now the one from the bishop. With the Mzungu's interpretation about falling sick means you have no vocation. And this is what he stated. I have doubts about this man's uh, psychological balance. <laughs> I think he's psychologically unfit and if he continues falling sick, I, I advise him to quit the seminary. That is what Rector Kalumba read to me there. And like you have laughed, both of us burst out laughing. Now, I knew I was not going to stop falling sick. As a matter of fact, while I was here, it became worse. While I had a monthly period of malaria in Katigondo, here it was fortunately. So I knew I was gone, and I started making my plans, plan B. I knew this journey had ended, and I was planning something else. If I'm not being called, why must I think that priesthood is a matter of life and death? That is lack of self-esteem, because you don't think you are capable of something, anything else. 
So while our society does not yet understand and appreciate the value of psychologists and psychiatrists, we probably need them now more than ever before. Our society is broken in many ways. Families are broken in many ways. The education system is broken in many ways. The church itself, so to speak, is broken in many ways. What do you want? And what do you expect? So according to me, we get it wrong if we assume that we are here to form and therefore must immediately embark on forming. There are underpinnings of brokenness that call for a kind of dismantling of the person, a deconstruction in order to reconstruct and then begin to form. Some formators are good role models. They accept their weaknesses and try as much as possible to give a good example of life to the seminarians. A seminary formator, by the way, should be a seminarian because he ought to be the first to submit the rules and regulations of formation. How could I not expect that? <laughs> Seminarians watch formators very closely. Before endorsing any principle or value, they consider the credibility of the person presenting, representing or transmitting the value. Is he authentic, sincere, coherent, available, and competent? And I trust my destiny to him. This means that they expect the formator to risk his own personal experience while taking into consideration their own individual experiences. Pope Paul VI put it right. Modern man does not listen to masters, but to witnesses. If he listens to masters, it is because they are witnesses. It is equally true that some enthusiastically welcome the model being enforced by Rome. No. No, no. Some formators do not measure up. No, it is equally true that some formators do not measure up to the expectation associated with their noble task. And that is why I am enthusiastic. And I really welcome the model that is being enforced by Rome, having an institute for academics and a wing for formation. We often take it that whoever has done further studies can form. It is wrong. The psych, the psych will always remain the pivot and balancing line for answering one's call. If it is neglected, then formation is wholesomely neglected. Indeed, the recovery, the rediscovery of the centrality of the formation of conscience will no doubt ascertain the possibility of an authentic discernment. As such, warding off partial and inauthentic responses to the calling. In all, there is a need to emphasize conscience formation. Conclusively, the very desire for transformation, the transformation of priestly formation, so that it can be meaningfully transforming of an individual, denotes a threshold to a new horizon identified with the scope of qualitative being and service, a critical revisiting of the tenets of individual and collective minds, and intellectual conversion. It is also a process of self-transcendence and leads one to go beyond horizons to face new ones. It is to always have new beginnings, to be ready for the new thresholds to be encountered 
in the process of understanding, judging, postulating. It is, in the final analysis, a willingness to know better, to see better, to be better, to act better. This is what ought to be the highest and noblest benefit from priestly formation at the horizontal level, if the vertical level is to make much sense. At the same time, it is what constitutes the new paradigm par excellence of priestly formation. Lastly, I would like to uh, choose all of you, beginning with the bishop, of being very good listeners. Thank you very much. Father, I didn't tell them to stand. They just did it. And tells you what you've just done unto us and for us. And okay. in their name and the name of the, all the audience that's online, I've got some very good comments on Zoom. Some people are following us from the US and around the country. They have sent their reviews and comments. And this is very exciting that we are not only here, but we are all over the world. And the mantra is. Gawa speaks, Gawa is listening. Thank you very much for inciting us in this discussion. And this is Gawa. You know? We have to be, like he said, pragmatic and sense the sense times, um, the signs of the times. It is lunchtime, and Gawa is speaking. And my director is going to give us the program, as we said, to create a more ambient time for discussions and sharing. So I thank you very much. As I said, keep note of those views and insights that you're getting, especially that you're going to share <coughs> in the wider panel when this session is done. I thank you very much for the opportunity, dear presenters, and all of you present. And I hand you over to MC. Thank you very much, Father Dr. Chivira, once again. Thank you very much, our dear beloved professor, Father Chisoga. Some of us are very proud to have been taught by you. And uh, the issues you raise really touch us very much as formators. I think you should be a consultant. <laughs> and we truly agree with a number of the issues that you raised. So I think this calls for more dialogue and as a new dynamic way of forming our young people. Uh, your presentation was irresistible. That's why I dispensed you from the time oh. allocated. <laughs> <laughs> so allow me to announce that uh, lunch is ready <coughs> for all of you in the students' dining hall. After lunch, we shall have a break, and we shall be here at exactly 2.30. Uh, we were meant to have the third presentation and discussion immediately, but I understand our chief guest, our bishop, has another commitment. He was supposed to come last, so he will begin by his speech and presentation, and that will be followed by the third presentation, followed by discussions, and time allowing, we shall avail opportunity for questions and other presentations. We already have questions and suggestions online. These are being processed and we shall pass them on to our beloved speakers. So I will ask. Yes, uh, we shall ask Father Kasadja, who's one of our spiritual directors, to lead us in the Angelus. Then we proceed for lunch. Father, you're welcome. Can I beg a student to take a microphone to him?
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, 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 full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Every man, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Pray for us, O oh, the Mother of God. Let us pray. Immaculate Heart of Mary, Saint Joseph. The grace. Bless us, O oh Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. with the remarks and comments written please leave them behind to help us to quicken up the process of responding you can leave your or during the break you can drop it at the table here
of the issues. Hey, Father Professor Chisoga. I'm told the bishop is giving us a few minutes to be working on the questions. So, uh, Father Chisoga, if you don't mind, I have a number of questions. Some of them came online, and most of them seem to be addressed to you. So, kindly, uh, we shall give you about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. But we still have time at the end. Um, disclaimer that I made the reflection does not mean that I have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, these are good for discussion for all of us to discuss. Otherwise, there are so many exams here in one. As far as I see, formation currently is full of timidities, whereby students are always followed as if they are children. Auto formation is dying off. Therefore, students should be given freedom and then be corrected in case of error, but not policing in each and every time. I think this is just a uh, lamentation. <laughs> <laughs> proposal, so sure, and we touched on this. We did touch on that. The conflict between policies, laws, and regulations based on dictatorship and self personal expression of seminarian. There's a lot of suppression of the real you of seminarians due to unnecessary policies. This can be discussed. Suppression, is that related to policing? Suppression by those who police? Those who police, you know, policing is a strong word, but there is a, a weaker form of it, which is part of the responsibility of forming, and which can also come because of lack of commitment by the person who is being formed. But also, like we said, we all need to get together and continue to learn together. Nobody has it all, but we need to continue to learn to learn to handle even ourselves. Most of the problems begin with us. We don't know what to do with ourselves. How can we know what to do with other people? If you are not good to yourself, how can you be good to the others? You cannot give what you don't have. If you're not kind to yourself, how can you be kind to another person? So I think there is a lesson here for, for all of us. And maybe we also need to know that there is a part of God in this thing. And, uh, let God do his part. Also. I usually say, a God whom 
you have to defend. He's no God. He's so weak. He's no God. God you have to fight for. He's no God. He's very weak. So we do our part, but let's leave the part of God also. Do not take it that you must, you know, bisect the person up to the soul and no thing that is going there. You know? Because action and reaction, the more you do that, the more they will hide. So we shall be helping them actually to, 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 to hide themselves for the more. Then we compound the problem. Uh, in your personal assessment, what is the quality of the priests ordained today in Uganda? The quality. I already made a lamentation here. That does not represent everybody. They are indeed good priests, really, really admirable priests, young and old. Even, uh, even among the old, you find the irresponsible. Some of these things we are talking about, even the old are there. Those who got deformed, do you think a time comes and they reform? They continue like that. Like I said, people who, who mask. I know old men who are still masking. Old men. <laughs> You just wonder. Oh yes. Oh yes. I will not mention anyone, but I know I know some. So what, what do you do? It's like akacha mamela, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's difficult to talk about quality. We talk about you know activity manifests being. That's one of the first uh, metaphysical principles. So from what you see outside, surely there are, there are things that a they, they, they tell us you cannot judge faith, you cannot. But St. James brings it out clearly. If I see you are a rude person, you are not kind at all. Should I call you a holy man? Really? No, that directs my mind somewhere else about you because of what I see about you. Living alone, these weaknesses that are common to all of us. There is development of technology and other aspects in the intellectual world. However, seminal formation has given no space to this change and that adapt adaptation, the adaptation. How can I take my notes written with faults and errors for years in pastoral duties, uh, when there is a possibility to be provided with the modern, soft or hard, uh, perfect notes for future years. Question, how can we adapt to the modern world in the world of academia? Are we still at zero in this? I don't think so. Really, don't we have computers here? Don't we have the internet? You have the smartphones and so on. All the smartphones are for other things, as usual, for other things, not for serious business. But I would like to think that, uh, though not at the highest level, there are certain things you cannot resist. Like uh, technology now, you cannot resist. Because there are people who are, full, who are with us virtually. They are attending this on Zoom. That's technology. And the link was generated here, I think. Yes. So I think uh, maybe somebody feels that everything, everything to the full should be provided and is not provided. Therefore, there is a problem. When he has a foreman. But I would like to believe that if it were possible to provide everything, I don't think that this seminary, the bishops who would simply say we don't want to provide, no. So a minimum acceptable, workable is normally provided and we base on that to, 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 to go ahead. Open it, the 16th claims, oh, claims that... Uh, <coughs> <laughs> that our era is characterized by relativism. I understand relativism as the hegemony 
of the individual, the individual becoming the source of the truth and the good, completely opposed and closed to all outside voices, including that of God. Precisely, what do you propose as elements constituting a response to relativism? First of all, uh, the first part is not completely true. Uh, it is true, yes, but that is not all. That's not all. It's not just about the individual, but also societies, cultures. One culture compared to another, if you are talking about values and so on, you know, don't judge. Ours is ours and yours is ours. This is our truth. This is our good. That is your truth. This is our morality. That is your morality. So not only individuals, but also groups and cultures. So what do I propose as elements constituting a response to relativism? Now, before I attempt that one, let me see, you talked about discussion. I don't know that this is your meaning of discussion, that, uh, that somebody is tormented with all the questions a lot. <laughs> but, uh, my... my You know, because it, 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 it gives the, the, the picture of a know-it-all, you know, a know-it-all. And on the other hand, I can also look at, at it like, hey, why did you say them? You answer, you know. But to me, a discussion means that we handle all these things, you know, all of us, and, and we share the ideas. If you don't mind, that's my understanding. Oh, that one is coming later. Okay. And the uh, bishop is not yet ready? Pardon? Father, seat of wisdom, seat of wisdom, pray for us to reach our It is time to open up Ugaba. Ugaba is closed. Offer some programs to Leite. Get them pay such that the seminar gets some money while teaching more people. Seminar programs can continue without disturbance. Secondly, Ugaba can work together with Uganda Matters University to receive some courses offered at UMU, for instance, management, communications, education, this can easily be done online. Let's share that. Seems like it would be the rector to, to respond to that. But I was just telling somebody out there that in 2002, 2000, uh, 2002, we worked on these programs. You now have the, the Master of Arts in Religious and the Theological Studies, but it was not the only one. We had the diploma, we had that Master's, we had another master's in philosophy and, uh, and um, development studies. Another master's was in social and management studies, something that I feel we need so, so much in the seminaries. We don't have studies in management. People go and gamble with the managing parishes and so on. The two never took off. The two never took off because the other one, they were secular. Think they were secular. And the idea was that lay people would come. And for Gama, it was suggested that outside, just outside the gate, where there is that building there, there could be a classroom there. And the lay people coming, you know, you attend with them there. After that, they go away, you come back in here. Even that was resisted. So the two programs that we labored to design simply died off like that. And this is what Father uh, Mulindwa is proposing. He's also proposing you could work with the GABA, open up and have some lectures and so on. I think that one will simply leave to, to GABA and even St. Paul's to, to reflect on. Honorable 
Ah, uh, this was for, I think, Honorable who went. Said, new times, new challenges, new answers. We need to find the new challenges. What are they today for seminary formation? I would do, I, <laughs> I didn't say this. This was honorable. But, but surely if I were to answer this, I would begin by saying, why would I have to find challenges? I already have too many of them and I have to look for challenges to find them. You know? Unless the person means we need to identify them. Maybe that's what is meant. We need to identify them. And I think right here, we are doing a bit of that. of identifying the challenges. Um, leadership for a new society. You say leadership is everything. I'm now suffering for honorable. How can we prepare a better leadership for tomorrow? What is professional has vision, set priorities right. I put here for discussion as uh, instructed by MC. <laughs> Gaba listens, Gaba speaks. We are in the syn synod of synodality. You have mentioned unity and solidarity. How are we to improve this unity and solidarity? Listening to each other, joining harmoniously together, Growing and pruning with all, we, uh, um, I think there is a question and answer already given also. What are the gaps that we need to fill, cover, so that Gaba at 50 may have more meaning as a unique, privileged institution of formation? What are the gaps? Some gaps are general, like those I touched, like... Uh, uh, my maestro has touched, and uh, like I believe the coming presenter will touch. You know, they are the general and they are the specific ones. For, for GABA as GABA, I don't know. I only know what I mentioned, that uh, the formators have not been academic enough. That I would say again and again because it is it's clear. The others, I know I cannot give evidence in court, but I know that masking on the part of students is still here. Lack of transparency is still here. And maybe on the side of staff, I, you people were clapping when some things were mentioned, when something was mentioned, uh, not everybody who has studied can be a formator. Maybe you know some. That's why you were clapping. So all those are there. They are, they are specific. <laughs> okay. Mm, this is the same thing. All oh, this one is the same thing. Do I need to continue? Now, Pope Benedict claiming, uh, yeah. This one we finished. Uh, that one we finished. It's development of technology. We finished. Um, oh. Wow. We are done. Eh? We are then done. But maybe I should simply say this. I'm not answering anything. By the time somebody says there is a lot of suppression, It's not a question to answer, but if it is there, if it is there, maybe let's pay attention. To it. Maybe things don't come out for nothing. I'm not going to say there is no smoke without fire. I no longer believe in that. By the way, it's no longer true. These days there can be smoke without fire. <laughs> oh yes, very clearly, very clearly. If if you still believe there can't be smoke without fire, then you have never seen somebody who has been made to leave the seminary for impregnating a girl whom he had never as much as touched the hand. Then you have never seen that because those things happen. That they will put it onto you, you did this. Something that you don't even know. Then you say there is no smoke without fire. These days there is a lot of smoke without fire. So, 
uh, I would just suggest, I would just suggest that since by doing this, we really mean to get more insights, we need to transform. If that's what we mean, when something comes out, it's like self-examination. If you are the formator who is a policeman here, even if your intentions are good, just think about it. If you are a priest, those of you who will not make it to the priesthood, it's not my saying it that will fail you. Yeah? Those of you who will not make it, these are the people we have in the public service. Responsible people. At this age, this is the age that has underwhelmed me by somebody still living the vocation of his mother. You know? So a person who does that is not going to appreciate anything that really challenges him. Some of us, when we are challenged, we call it persecution, we call it policing. Hello. But somebody who tells you, please do this, don't do this, is better than somebody who will look at you. Yeah? One time, one of my sisters in law asked me, does your brother really love me? I said, mm hmm. He said, however much I annoy him, he does not beat me, he does not shout at me. If somebody simply looks at you, go your way. Is that person interested in you? No. So why don't we begin to see things in the positive? In the positive. Somebody is saying, don't go out. Don't go out. If you go out, it can be problematic. So one who tells you not to go out, where well, you can get a problem. And one who simply looks at you and says, oh, that one who is going to fall in that ditch and looks away. Who really cares about you? So I think we should also learn to look at things more positively. Yeah? Look at things more positively. For a seminarian who is 28 years, who simply clap because they say they have talked about one who polices him, that is lack of seriousness, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph Chisoga. And now I take this opportunity to invite his Lordship to address us. Thank you, Father Magunda. Allow me to use the opposed address, the Honorable, Honorable Yingo, my fellow colleagues. I bring you greetings from the Chairman of the Uganda Episcopal Conference, Bishop Joseph Ziwa who delegated me to represent him in this public lecture today. Because he had other engagements which he could not avoid. On my own behalf, on behalf of the Uganda Episcopal Conference, I'd like to express our appreciation to the rector and the organizers of this public lecture today here at GABA. Appreciate the staff, the student body. Appreciate the presenters, Honorable 
Mkono Kristo Miungo is here this morning. Brother Silverno, Brother Joseph Kiseka, Soga, and even Mr. Tega who is going to address us after Yeah. I like to appreciate the seminarians also for their contribution and all of you who have come to attend this public lecture today. I like now to give my brief personal remarks. Uh, today reminded me of a debate we had. 1979, when the pastor of spiritual year was about to begin. Remember, there was late father John Waligo, another priests were debating about the pros and the cons of the pastor of spiritual year. And those debates helped us, some of us were the first or second group that went for the pastor of spiritual year. And I believe the seminarians must be benefiting, hopefully, the coming years for what is being said here. I'm grateful to God for being a product of Gaba National Seminary here in 1983, 1985, for the formation that we received at that time. Grateful to the seminary staff at the time and for our contemporaries at that time. Those who made it the priesthood, and even those who did not make it, the lay people. The lay people are also useful to the church and they saw it out there because they are in responsible positions as uh, Father. So I just mentioned. So the formation, even if those who don't make it, is not a waste. Somehow benefits the society out there. As we celebrate, as we prepare to celebrate the fifth year's brother's existence, it's good to examine the past, the present, and look to the future. It's like, I think, having some kind of servicing a machine, like in a factory. If a machine is working after some time, it's good to stop for a while, see the good products that are being come, coming out through that machine, those which are not coming out well, and maybe find out which parts are not functioning well, or what could be not going right, or what's going right. What is going right can be continued. What's not going right, not going right can be put, put right or be replaced with their one of parts. To do that well requires an expert or another person to help you look at things objectively. Dr. Soga has done that very well. He has talked of the formators with the bishops are part of that game. The formation staff, the seminarians need to look at ourselves. When I was here the first year, I had a little crisis. I had just read an article that my bishop, late Bishop Pangamo, had written something kind of criticizing the formation staff. I read that article a few times, remember, and learning what he had written. So I swallowed his ideas. And at the time, we were the first to go for urban degree. So I felt like I should just go for urban degree and leave my career diploma. So I remember 
I went to Father Ben Fass, who was the dean of studies at the time. I told him, yeah, well, I want to leave the Makere diploma and focus only the urban degree. He went and looked at my file. He said, but you're intelligent enough. What's your problem? He said, my problem is not, not understanding things, but I would wish to concentrate on the urban degree so that I can understand the personal issues there. I went to Maramwe Priest. In the, in the ministry where I've just been. He said, you can do it. I said, could I go and talk about this with the rector? He said, I'll think twice before I go and see the rector. The rector by then was Bishop Sekamanya. So after supper, I was at the rector's office. Doi, 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 doi. Let me in. I sat down and then I started presenting my argument. Listen very attentively. And he said, it is God's will that you do my career diploma as well. In my heart I said, no, it's not God's will. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, I started debating, is this what I really want to do here? I felt like leaving the seminary because I thought, these formators here, I think they are forming us instead of forming us. I went to my spiritual director that was really disturbing me and discussed it with him so he guided me to take the course because it is important for part of information which I was not seeing but from that time on I kind of conformed and moved on taking also my career diploma said the urban degree so I don't regret that I took my career diploma as well helped me to expand my knowledge and appreciate what goes on in the academic world. As we are here now, we need to look at the products that are coming out of here, as mentioned by Father Silverno. The parish priests, the curates, our chaplains in schools and hospitals, and how they are performing. And we need to look at why are they doing well or not so well. Those need to be addressed. But also we need to look at the new questions that uh, are coming up, which are a challenge. With the use of social media, the phone. Some of us have the phones, but we just think of calling friends only. Yeah, there's so much on the, that phone, as I've just been saying, that you could be using it even for your academic work. What is the impact of this phone on our families, on our youth today? We need to pose the hard questions of immorality. The other day I got a message on the phone that some girls were sent away from, 13 girls sent from one senior secondary school. And uh, one girl confessed that they are being given 600,000 shillings per month to promote lesbianism in school. So you can imagine somebody coming from a poor family getting 600,000 per month. What will that student do in school? You have to continue to promote the vice. And of course you do it still silly, but if that is not attended, this is something that we need to address. And we address those questions. Seminarians, tomorrow you are the chaplains in those schools. How are you going to handle those students? You have to get the tools. A few years ago, when we were celebrating 25 years anniversary of St. Paul, Yamaska, I remember Professor John Maviri putting this question. We are producing so many seminarians every year. I mean, priests rather. 
Why is it that we seem not to have any political impact on this country? You know, we still just move on and on and on. We have no positive impact on the politics of this country. How can we improve to do better with the different political, socio-economic questions? How can we improve on our pastoral and academic performance? I'm throwing questions. I don't have the answers, but I think it is this audience and maybe others to help us find answers to, this, to these questions. So I'd like to appreciate this public lecture, the public lecture today. And I request that uh, let there be a summary made for us as bishops, because what is being discussed here is very important for us to make decisions to improve on our formation, not only in Gaba, in Yamaska, St. Imbaga, all our seminaries, because I can see and hear very serious questions being raised in this place. So my wish is that this debate, this discussion continues so it helps us to be objective and realistic in addressing the different issues pertaining to our formation. And I believe if we take some of these Questions being addressed seriously, we shall get the answers and they help us to do things better. And eventually, hopefully, we can get better products from our seminaries. With these few remarks, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I pray God's blessings upon you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Lordship. I think we shall get a word from the rector or the vice rector to cast a vote of thanks to his Lordship. Father Jude, our Dean of Studies, you've been delegated <laughs> <laughs> to cast a vote of thanks to his Lordship for his address. Your Lordship, Bishop Robert Muhira, the local ordinary of Cassis Diocese. <laughs> Forty Porto. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not the first to say Cassis. Don't know. I'm sorry, for the Porto Diocese and the Vice Chairman of the Uganda Episcopal Conference. I stand here to move a vote of thanks to you. First of all, for accepting to be with us. We know you have said you are busy, but you have given us all this time. He came yesterday. And you teach us a lot. Especially simplicity. We thank you for the parental uh, words you have given us. And uh, the assurance we get from your presence, just being with us, we are assured of uh, your guidance 
and love. So, to the Episcopal Conference, convey our greetings and uh, gratitude for all that they do for our seminary. I wish you a safe journey back to Porto, and may God bless you. Yes, his lordship has been requested to impart on us an apostolic blessing. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God our loving Father, we thank you and praise you for this day when we're having this public lecture. We pray and thank you for all that we have been able to hear from the different presenters. And Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit may continue to work through all of us here present, that whatever is being discussed now may help us continue to appreciate our formation, where there are flows. Lord, help us to put them right as we plan and prepare to celebrate on the 12th of this month, next month. We pray that you bless this seminary the formators, the students, that all of us may benefit for better products of this seminary and also the other seminaries which are represented here, that your work may continue to improve as witness to you day by day, striving to serve you. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Mary, Queen of the Apostles, all our patron saints, all the martyrs of Uganda. The Lord be with you. And may the God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Stay in the peace of Christ. Thank you very much, Your Lordship, for being with us. I'm told we're going to have a photo with the bishop. So you will allow us a few moments from now. The staff members of National Seminary Gava. Allow me at this juncture to introduce to you the remaining part. I would like to inform those who are with us and those who are following us online that the public lecture is not yet over. The chief guest has had to leave because of some commitment, but we still have one uh, presentation. I would like to give an announcement. We are informed that we have some jubilee items, such as caps, t-shirts, and so on, in our canteen here. So during your break, you can buy some for yourself. There is somebody I introduced, but I would like to introduce him fully once again. 
This seminary started 50 years ago, and we are blessed to have one of the OBs, the pioneers of this seminary. Father Benedict Birunji, kindly come forward so that we can look at what the pioneer looks like. <laughs> Father Benedict Birunji is currently the chaplain of Kampala International University and is a priest of Mbarara Archdiocese. <laughs> and from my home parish. Allow me now, before we begin the third presentation, to introduce the moderator who will invite the presenter. As I said at the beginning, our moderators are very heavy people and it's very hard to compress them in a short, in a short time. But I will try to be as brief as possible. May I ask our professor Vincent Bagire to stand up for recognition? Professor Vincent Bagire will be our moderator for the third presentation. He is a seasoned expert in strategic management and a assiduous reader and writer with several publications and works authored by him. He is a distinguished lecturer with an experience of 25 years of university teaching. He is outstanding in the publication of journals in teaching and research, and in the search for knowledge in the several areas of his competence. As a student, he has gone through the doors of the following higher institutions of learning. National College of Business Studies, Nakawa, Uganda Matters University, Makerere University, and lastly, the University of Nairobi, where he obtained a PhD in strategic management in 2012. His profession and career has seen him through several posts of employment. He has been a marketing assistant, he has been an accountant, he has been a national coordinator, youth apostolate, Uganda Catholic Secretariat, he has been a lecturer at the National College of Business Studies called so by then in 1997 and 1998. He has been assistant lecturer Finance and Administration Officer at the Uganda Catholic Secretariat, a program officer to do with HIV AIDS at the Uganda Catholic Secretariat. He has been a lecturer at Makerere University Business School and has risen to senior lecturer and then senior lecturer and head of department business administration, senior lecturer and associate dean faculty of graduate studies, Deputy Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, Associate Professor of Strategic Management, and lastly and currently is the Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research at MOOBS. So he is not a simple man. Professor, we are honored and privileged to have you with us this afternoon to moderate our third presentation. Professor Bagira is a writer and so many works bear his name as author. I was trying to go through his profile and I counted more than 80 works that bear his name as author. So he has written books, book chapters and monographs that have been published, referred journal articles, published cases, peer-reviewed published conference proceedings and presentations, non-scholarly papers published in professional journals, articles in professional journals, magazines, and newsletters, and he has completed a number of faculty research projects and disseminated findings. He is currently undertaking some faculty projects. Professor Bagire has held several scholarly responsibilities, including that of assistant editor of the Africa Journal of Management. He is a member of the professional, is a member of a number of professional bodies and has received a number of awards, outstanding among them being the 2022 Distinguished Alumni and Diamond Ambassador of Uganda Matters University. Last but not least, Professor Bajire is a committed and pious Catholic originating from Hoima Diocese and as you've heard, 
has an experience working with the Uganda Catholic Secretariat. He's very much acquainted with the Catholic Church, which he loves and serves devotedly. We could not find a better choice for the moderator today for today's public lecture. As we reflect on the past, the present, and the future of National Seminary Gaba. Thank you, Professor Bagire, for accepting to be moderator to today's function. And with this said, I wish to invite him to introduce to us the third presenter. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Father Mabunda, for that humbling introduction. When I was about to start ex getting excited with uh, those titles, uh, my mind went back to Senior 2, Chemistry, 1984. There was a topic about valency, an element of a higher valency displaces the one of the lower one. And in the audience, I saw Professor Semakura Kiwanuka, who has the highest valency. So when you talk about me as a professor, you'll be referring to him. <laughs> so as I moderate the session, So if you say thank you, Professor, you'll be referring to him because of chemistry. <laughs> so you will humbly just say thank you, Vincent, so that we don't go into diplomatic rows with him. But he looks a former seminarian. <laughs> uh, Professor looks a, a former seminarian. People have asked me that I look a former seminarian, but I swear in the name of the Lord, I've never been in the seminary. <laughs> yes. But I've been very close to seminarians, right from primary one. I've been close to seminarians, and I thank God that uh, as a later, I've been close to your formation, close to the minister of the clergy, and close to the ministry uh, of the bishops themselves, as I, I work with them in various ways. I'm humbled to be requested to moderate this session, and my work is simple, I'm not going to talk, but to cause people to talk but the titles will be coming to me first before they thank the, the people who my, whom I have asked to speak. That is how life goes. And so today, to speak before you this afternoon is a dedicated Catholic, young man, old man, youth. He combines all those things. He has been a youth leader, and so he still has a lot of youthfulness in him. And when we sit here, we have the National Youth Coordinator, Madam Joy, when she looks at Mr. Mateka, she sees him as a youth, because he was a youth leader of Namwaya Parish many years ago. But from a small youth leader in Namwaya Parish, he has come to be the National Vice President of the Leite in Uganda. As a Catholic, he has been Sava Christo at sub parish level, parish level, um, vicariate level, and Kampala at diocesan level before rising to the national level. He's a former Sava Christo of Kampala at diocese. He's married with children, and God blessing, grandchildren will come. <laughs> Mr. Matega Anthony has served the church without reserve. And in many pages he gave me here, some of which I have known about him, is the founder of the Fishers of Men Foundation. And this church organization is assisting in getting benefactors for the economically disadvantaged seminarians. So after here you may have asked him for a card if you are an economically disadvantaged seminarian. <laughs> This is bringing services near to the people. So <laughs> we thank Father Jude for fishing him. You know, you, so if you see many seminarians coming around you, don't run away. The founder, you are founder of Fishers of Men. He's also the founder of Spiritual Mothers to the Holy Priesthood, an organization I'm certainly uh, sure you are aware of that supports the formation and the devotion praying for the seminarians. 
So while you are here, he has a group praying for you. So this is Gaba. He's praying for you outside Gaba. Yes. Uh, he's the member of the Ruaga Cathedral Foundation. You are aware of its works. And also, he sits on several boards, both in the corporate world, in secondary schools of the Catholic Foundation, and on several committees, especially when you're organizing Matters Day. He's always there. He's a, a permanent member of the Namugong Matters Day uh, celebrations. He has talked about the church a lot, and uh, I know he has come even to the seminary here and the other seminaries to talk to the students about your, uh, your formation. Outside this great church work, he's a professional um, in insurance, he's a chartered insurer and has worked in that industry for close to 30 years and he's a professional in political science and the public administration of Makere University. But he's a, he not only looks, but he's a former seminarian. Yes. So he is a seminarian from Kisubi Minor Seminary for O and A level. Why did not go to Katigo and Rock Room? Don't ask me. He will talk about it himself. Possibly there was another science that side. That was 1984 to 1990 when he completed A level at Kisubi uh, Minor Seminary. Uh, Mr. Matega Anthony is an accomplished, an accomplished farmer. And uh, Father Jude has organized this the 12th of November. If we need the PIG which can serve the whole of this seminary, he has a stock of them. And being a good Catholic, he might be willing to give back to the church. <laughs> I hope I'm not putting you into a quagmire, but uh, as a Catholic, you know this. Uh, he, won the, he won the prestigious award of best Uganda farmer in 2019. Yes. It is, he is involved in mixed farming. He has poultry, he has piggery, he has diary, and 40 acres of coffee. Yes, so this is Mr. Matega. As a, a later, he has a lot of stories to tell in the formation of the clergy. And so, wouldn't have had a better person uh, to be invited for this afternoon session. And uh, certainly, the afternoon session is usually between you and your sleep, but uh, he will try to disengage you from that sleep. I take therefore this honor to invite Mr. Anthony Nakiaria Matega to address us. In the previous program, he had been given 60 minutes, just as the uh, professor can take a seat there, then I finish up with the, uh, okay, as, the, as Professor Bishana said in the, in earlier in the morning, he had prepared the text for one hour and tried to use one hour. But I wanted to talk a little about uh, um, uh, Father Bishana, professor. In our youth words, is a deacon Buchana, and there are two deacons in this country who have been priests for 30 years. Deacon Buchana and uh, Deacon Sebitosi John Bosco is from Hoima. Why? They were sent to the national team of the YCS in 1990. I was on the national team of the YCS on that year, and so they were posted to be part of the national team to bring to us the lay youth leaders a feeling of spiritual formation. And so they were very close to us as deacons, Deacon Sebitosi and Deacon Kisoga. Up to now, we call them deacons. <laughs> because they did a very good job amongst us. So Deacon Kisoga, <laughs> I was very happy to see you uh, as you gave your uh, discussion. My mind went back to the 1990s when you would remind us as YCS leaders, please as we discuss this, let's do this, this, this and that. And indeed you did a good job as a deacon. So Deacon Nixoga, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Mr. Matega can take over the audience now.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For the sake of protocol, in absence here, our keynote address speaker, Honorable Jesse Moyingo. Also in the absence, the Right Reverend Joseph Muhira, Vice Chairman of Uganda Episcopal Conference and Bishop of Fort Porto Diocese. The Rector, staff, the Rectors present herein, and the staff, or from haters, members of the clergy, religious, and seminarians, in a special way, I equally once again recognize the presence of the former Sabah Christ of Kampala Archdiocese, who was my predecessor, Mr. Robert Semper, herein. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the beauty of being the last person to give you a talk, chances are that so many people have already given what you are supposed to talk. So, it may be more of summaries or a hint here or there. What is unique about us is that, minus the chief or the keynote speaker, we've had the clergy, and equally we're ending with the members of the laity. My presentation is not so much in the scholarly manner. As I've already said, it is an experience of my ministry, hands on. What do you sit down on the ground through the 10 years as head of the late in Kampala Archdiocese, equal as vice head of the late in Uganda, and even at the lower levels, especially in the parish, which is the pivotal point of pastoral work within the church. So it's partly an experience of that, but equally, my love and passion for the pastors of the church. And so it is something that is, I take keen interest into. I'll make here a disclaimer. I'm basically talking to theologians and philosophers, and I've already said so. I've never stepped in a school of philosophy, neither a school of theology. But I take time to read books and understand the mind of the church. That one I do, without fear or favor. Yes. I had a hint or a stint in the seminary, only six years, but they are real years of formation. The only thing I regret in my seminary formation was when I was 14 years old, I was made to be like a 20-year-old man. I had to act like a 20-year-old, whereas I was. So my psychology had to, you lift up senior three, rather 13 years, you are still thinking like a 13 year old, but you are told act like one who is in Katigondo. So I had to march along, along and along. So it was something that I was, had to take keen interest into, depending on the age, especially when it comes to minor seminaries. But with the time, you come to appreciate what life is all about. We are looking forward to celebrating 50 years of the existence and the being of our beloved St. Mary's National Major Seminary, Gaba. We are not simply celebrating existence, but celebrating the being of Gaba Seminary. After all, even stones exist, but are never celebrated. So, why the being of Gaba Seminary? Because through all the years of its presence in our Mideast, it has continued to grow and having impact on all the dioceses of Uganda and beyond. It has lived to the mission and purpose why the church founded it. Its fruits are being manifested in the priestly services rendered throughout the world and down to the roots of the Christian communities spread all over. It is be, its being is further manifested through the services and the soul to the world being rendered by the many who were called and providence through seminary formators, whether by default or design, decided or were advised otherwise and have joined the world. The world is in quotes. 
I am delighted to present to you this paper as a member of the laity. I don't know what prompted the rector to choose me or his committee, but I'm very honored and I'm very happy to be here. Therefore, when you're making your, your critique and assessment, given what I've already given as a disclaimer, not as a philosopher or a theologian, my presentation is as lay as I am a lay person. The theme given to me for this particular lecture is the, law, the role of the laity in the formation of future priests. The role of the laity in the formation of future priests. Throughout this presentation, wherever the term laity will be used, it will have the following meaning. All the faithful, except those in holy orders and those in religious state, as sanctioned by the church. Equally throughout this paper, the mind of the church towards the family is being emphasized. It is seen as the first and best expression of the social dimension of the person. It is the community in which from childhood one can learn the moral values, begin to honor God, and to make good use of freedom. I think that can be found in canon number 2207. Family values like filial respect, love and care for the aged and the sick, love of children and harmony are held in high esteem, and they all come from the family. So the family is not simply an object of the church's pastoral care, but it is also the church's effective agent of evangelization. In short, we can say that the mind of this paper is centered more on the corresponsibility for the ministry and formation of the future priests. Co-responsibility for the ministry and formation of the future priests. In as far as I'm concerned, the duty to form the future pastors of the church lies between the clerical formators and the other side, which even lays the foundation with the laity. It is deemed that in exercising co-responsibility, there should be sincerity of purpose, respect for each person, and openness to new learning, knowledge, and integrity are of utmost importance for the common pastoral cause and action. During priestly ordination in the Catholic Church, there is always a captivating dialogue between the bishop and the vocations director as candidates are being presented. The vocations director. Most Reverend Father, Holy Mother Church asks you to ordain these men, our brothers, to the service as priests. Bishop replied, Do you judge them worthy? The vocation director. After inquiry among the people of Christ, and upon recommendation, After inquiry among the people of Christ and upon recommendation of those concerned with their training, I testify that they have been found worthy. The bishop replies, we rely on the help of the Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ and we choose these men, our brothers, for the priesthood in the presbyterial order. The gist of this paper lies in the reply given by the vocations director above after inquiry among the people of God. How do the people of God contribute to this worthiness? There is some degree of, there is some degree of collective responsibility in the formation of priests. This is why in his apostolic exhortation, Pastoris Dab of Obis, Pope St. John Paul II stated clearly that, um, that among the agents of formation in the priests to the priesthood, they are the church and the bishop the seminars and education community, the professors and in bold letters, the communities of origin, communities of origin and youth movements, and lastly, the candidate himself. So my focus is on the communities of origin. This very statement is what prompted Emmanuel Cardinal Wamala to remark in 
in his ordination homily on 9th August 2003, he said that a priest is a bridge that provides a connection between the people, the people and God. Should you discover later that the bridge I have erected is a weak one, you should not blame me as a bishop, but yourselves, because you provided the timber which I used to construct the bridge. So I asked the parents to give me on season the timber. Those were the words of Emmanuel Cardinal Wamala. The Catholic Church is never in a hurry to ordain men to the Catholic priesthood. It is meticulously done in such a way that everyone joins the formation of her candidates. Now I go to the real stuff. My paper is divided into three parts. One, the training of the priest, this time the priest in quotes, in the African traditional setting. Was there a role to be played by the late of that time, if I'm to call them? Number two, the mind of the church in the training of a Catholic priest based on Vatican Council II, with a particular reference to the decree on the training of priests. And finally, we shall make some specific recommendations in respect of the later for the formation of priests and a conclusion. The African traditional setting. My community of reference for the African traditional region is going to be based on the Ganda people here in central Uganda. The concept of God was not foreign at all to all the African societies. In fact, within some societies, a comprehensive system had grown and partly contributed to either the success by providing a fertile ground or environment or the possible failure to the Christian religion when it came in. For example, here within Buganda, it was compulsory every morning to have a prayer led by the head of the household making incantations seeking the intervention of God in the affairs of the day. You can refer to the African Holocaust by Joseph Faupel. We find different levels of worshipping places starting from within the household. Each household had a shrine, what we are calling a sabo. We shall see how this is going to be used in the formation of a Catholic priesthood today. And the head of the household was the man and the leader of prayer in traditional Uganda. Prayer in the household shrine was a daily basis. Daily basis, you had to go to the sabo. Women were responsible for the cleaning and guaranteeing the etiquette of worshipping. Even women had a role to play. They were responsible, one of their main duties, they were responsible for the transmission of the faith to the children. From the household shrine, we found the bigger shrine, which we call a chigwa. And this was communal in nature, as several families and clans gathered therein in the chigwa. Prayer in the chigwa was once in a month, but the highest chigwa, which the Baganda called the Rutiko, that's why you call Lubaga Rutiko, Namirembe Rutiko, was used at least three or four times in a year. Strictly all priestly ordinations of the Baganda were to be conducted in the Rutiko. It would be compared to a parish or a cathedral church in our context. In the Chigua, the role of a priest known as a Kabona was more eminent and the formation of priests to serve there was quite very elaborate. Mothers who were responsible for the moral upbringing of children in a more intimate way were always consulted as to which children would serve best in the Chigua, the mothers. One of the key values that was sought in anyone who was to serve as a priest was confidentiality of the highest order. It could be compared to the confessional seal in the church. It was the biggest abomination one could do, and it led it to instant dismissal from the priestly state once certain confidentiality was broken. And it at times attracted even death penalty, depending on whose case the seal had been broken. Another important value that was sought among those to be presented to the priesthood in Buganda 
was the virtue of chastity among the women who served in the Chigwa, especially a Chigwa Chaka Tonde Butonda. Strictly, it was only virgins who were allowed to serve there. And the priests, or the Kabonas, were expected to be celibate or continent for those who are serving in the highest Chigwa of Buganda. Chastity was in two forms according to them, having no sexual relations with a man or woman whatsoever, and then the second form was in purity of heart, in spite of having had a relationship before. In choosing who was to be trained and formed, it started from a relatively youthful age. Society or the community had to pronounce itself on those to be seconded for this noble duty. According to them, it was not a human act, but the spirits were the ones to choose the elect. It is the spirits to choose the one who was to be elected. I don't know whether it's the Holy Spirit who does that in the church, but I believe so. In some instances, during the ordination ceremony, some candidates would be returned, will be returned with the reason that the spirit had not appointed that particular person. Or he was seen to be unfit for the ministry as he would not entirely sacrifice himself for the cause of the priesthood in Buganda. Since virginity was a prize, equally chaste men were in abundance. In most cases, it was a lifetime career, and abscondiment from duty was seen as a treason to the gods. The training period of priests in Buganda was quite long, according to those times. One must have mastered the preliminaries of priesthood in the earlier years, through come and see. They used to go, you come, and you see, and you return. The syllabus was comprehensive, as one had to study all the 18 gods and their attributes. Culture, traditions, and taboos took another long time of studying, because the priest was the medium of the gods and the chief interpreter of all the signs. Yet all those were mysteriously hidden in culture and the taboos. The study of medicine was part of the training in addition to hospitality and counseling. Equally important was the understanding and the creation of mystery, both in the form of respect and fear. The study of bad spirits. I think here in you call it, do you call it demonology? Anyway, demonology, that one. The study of the bad spirits, of bad spirits was given eminence in the training of the carboners of that time. Because it was one of the most hectic but rewarding service the Kabona did. A priest who was having exorcism powers was always the richest because he was usually the deliverer of several families and received many gifts. However, not all priests during that time, even in Uganda, aspired for that power as it called for a lot of sacrifice and discernment in a bid to know the exact bad spirit that was disturbing the families. Part of the, of the syllabus was to study the rites of worship, and they had to be well mastered. Surprisingly, there was a lot of semblance in the order of worship and even our current Christian mass, Catholic mass. For example, in Buganda, all members of the household had to gather, gathered and started with what we call today praise and worship. A lot of drumming and singing for close to an hour. Thereafter, when everybody was full of the spirit, then the Kabona would appear in his paraphernalia with majesty. He was always talking in his normal voice. And everybody could tell him all her problem, which was the, which was the intercession. However, the gods could not listen to the, petitions, to the petitions unless all members had acknowledged their sinfulness. Because it was believed that standing before the gods with his sin and seeking God's favors, the same favor could turn out to haunt you, or even you never get it. Hence, a penance of sorts took place with a promise never to do harm to your neighbors. When intercessions were done, then in a bit of oats, offertory in forms of box, goats, banana wine, and harvest were presented to goats through the priest. Now with a very happy priest with all the gifts and offertory, drumming resumed and singing, and the God now could come down through the priest. This is the reason why at that particular moment, 
when the Kabona was going to talk with the gods, the voice of the Kabona had to change from the human to the divine. He has been talking normally as a human being. Now the voice has changed because God is descending on you. It was not the Kabona speaking, but God's. It was no longer reported speech, but direct speech. After this, the congreg congregants would be happy because they had heard God speaking directly to them. Could we call that the liturgy of the word? I don't know. Coming back from the ecstatic moments, the priest would be back to his senses and begin to speak as a human being once again. A common meal followed, which we would call communion, and then the dispersing of the congregation. So it was incumbent upon the Kabona to learn all those rites. And those had been inculcated to them in the family. The last training phase before the ordination of that Kabona usually lasted in nine or 18 days. Nine is the sacred number of the Baganda. And whatever was offered to appease or thank the gods was in nines. Nine women, nine cows, nine goats, 18 chicken, which was a multiple of nine, and nine bibanja. The ordination ceremony was always very expensive with a lot of demands. Over 100 items were needed and in multiples. Hence, it involved the entire clan and families, all communities. Why the involvement of all the entire clan and community? Because they are fully convinced that the priest was not for the family or the household, but the entire community. Whenever there was a laicization, in quotes, it was a shame to the community, and more specifically to the family, where the priest was coming from. The main cause of laicization during in the Boganda times of the, those days was breaking that seal, the confessional seal. You uttered what you were not supposed to utter to people. Adultery and lack of respect for the very profession one stood for. That's why you find proverbs like, You are the one who first profanes your chigwa by doing what is not supposed to be done there. It was for this reason that parents and community took all effort to present those who were the best for the priesthood. Who were the best? Families also had a duty to beget as many children as possible to avoid the scenario of having one lone son and the gods have demanded that he is consecrated to them as a kabona. So it was incumbent upon the family to have one chosen out of the many. All in all, the family was responsible for the nurturing, forming children in social etiquette and they were the custodians of culture and they had to transmit the same to the child. The traditional priest was a community or a clan priest who was equally accountable to all of the people. In summary, it's very clear that the community, and more specifically the family and the clan, had the responsibility. And to determine the quality of priests they wanted, there were measures and controls in who would qualify for that noble office. You have had an idea of what the traditional society did. What is the mind of the church in the training of a Catholic priest based on Vatican Council II? Vatican Council II, in the decree on the training of priests, states clearly, and I quote, the duty of fostering vocations falls on the whole Christian community, not only priests, not only reformators, the whole Christian community, and they discharge it principally by living full Christian lives. There is an aspect of witness. This council is called a pastoral council, and it effectively called for meaningful dialogue between the church and the world, the clergy and the laity, and other forms of dialogue. This dialogue has an impact on priestly formation. Hence, in the mind of the council, it could no longer see the seminary as a closed institution, silently preparing candidates to redeem the sinful world. The seminary has to be right in the center of the society it is intending to serve, being influenced by it and influencing society in return. We can get this from the history of the African priest by Father Dr. J.M. Waligo. 
the family as the first seminary. My paper is the law of the laity in the formation of priests. The greatest contribution is made by families which are animated by the spirit of faith, charity, and piety. And hence, our families are the first seminary. And by the parishes, which are pivotal in the pastoral life of the church, as I've already said. The family as the first seminary is equally the first school of faith. It's the first school of prayer. And it's the first school of Christian custom. It is the first ground most adapted for priestly and religious vocations to bloom. The family or community of origin sets forth the foundation on which all the future formators are to build. All the current formators are building on the family. It anchors the building with all forms of props, and hence when the priests are living on their own and are no longer under the possible watchful eye of the seminary formators, there was the word policing, and I'm using the word possible watchful eye of the seminary formators, they will have a notable degree of auto-formation. When you are no longer here in the seminary, auto-formation will be the answer. And they will be able to cope and continue progressing after the seminary props have been withdrawn. Usually the family formation values return at the stage when you have left the seminary. I did a survey of close to 80 priests and religious with a question to the effect that what were the key values from your background that have had continuous impact on your formation to date and are still impacting you. It was almost a unanimous answer that they all counted themselves blessed having come from a good family. The family. I can quote one of them. In my own family, I was blessed to have religious and practicing parents. We would wake up every day at 6 a.m. to pray and in the evening, the same. Prayer is being anchored. Tradition of Uganda is starting with the anchoring of prayer by the head of the family. The prayers were long, but you had to stay alert throughout and there was no compromise over the posture. You have to kneel, you have to kneel. Prayer was not an option. Nowadays, even among the pastors, prayer becomes an alternative. Should I say the prayers or not? The family is going back. That would take us 10 kilometers to parish X to pray mass as it was said in those days. Every Sunday at 7, except when the priest came to our center, our parish. With such life of prayer, the breviary has never been a burden to me neither the daily rosary. This preparation looks and sounds to be remote, but it is not remote at all. When I was doing some pastoral visits within our parishes, there was a parish we visited, and there was always this priest when we came to know what are some of your key areas that need improvement in your parish. He categorically said, he was still a young priest, he said categorically, my parish priest always insists on a full rosary during the month of October and May. Can't we say only one decade? So I said, what's the problem with the full rosary? He said, that is old times. Why say five decades? It should be only what? So, if you are saying one, I'm supposed to be saying only one here, Mary, and I go. Where do you get the moral authority to tell me to have the rosary during the month of May when you yourself, one, one decade is already a burden? Already what? Maybe because, let me respect him, he wants us to say the rosary. But the family. The witness of parents, when we are young, we know that they are the best, they are the cleverest, they are the strongest, they are the wisest. In, the, in, in our years as youngsters, and it's very, very critical. The word is witness of the parents. When it is good, the results to the youngster are good, great. When it is weak, it becomes a time bomb. The quick question that comes up now is the issue of the family. For example, the example of parents is a very crucial guide in the future pastor. When he's performing the roles of a guide, a mentor, a provider, 
the caretaker and the servant lead. Question, how many people nowadays come from families, even within the seminary? How many seminarians really come from families? The idea of the family is becoming sort of archaic. Of all institutions, it is the family that has got the biggest number of challenges and enemies in all forms. There are families in very unique situations. Of course, we have got conventional families. We have got widowed families. We have got stay-at-home moms, village-raised children, and they all form part of the seminar. The rate of divorce is high, or even simply accommodative marriages. Well, I'm there. Let me accommodate him. This Saba Chris Mananda Batanga to our Kanyanemo Kazuangi. I'm with Saba Chris. Let me stay with her, but deep in me, the marriage is no longer. So it is an accommodative marriage. We have very many single parent families. We have got corporate mother families or corporate father families. We have got what you are calling apartment parent families. I've got my job. I can afford and rent an apartment and take care of my child. It is usually one child. I don't mind, even if... And now, those are the children that are coming to the seminary. No problem with that. The sense of identity even is lost right from the names. Such children are always given funny names. They'll never be identifiable with the wood. When I hear the name Chimbawa, I know it's coming from the Ngongi clan. When I hear this, I know it's coming from here. But the children of the apartment families, it is usually Chisache, Kwagalakwe, Sanyu, they are disguised because they don't want to have a definitive The dynamics change and sometimes very drastically. As long as you don't have both parents, take note, both parents taking responsibility over children, we shall have unbalanced children and adults. Both touches are necessary. The fatherly touch and the motherly touch in the formation of a child and more so he who is aspiring for the priesthood. When we lack that balance, we are bound to get priests and religious, and even later, who are, par uh, who are in perpetual adolescence. The man is 30 years, years, he's still an adolescent. He's 40 years, he's still an adolescent. Perpetual adolescence. They never grow. You give them responsibility, they act like children. Sorry to use the word. Because he had to outlive certain, but because of lack of the parent aspect, we are not balanced, hence the perpetual adolescents. One of the cardinal duties of the laity is the duty of childbearing. It is almost the sole responsibility of the mother, as she is the only one who can carry and bear a child. Childbearing is a very essential responsibility because without this fulfillment, we cannot have the complete triangle of a father, mother, and children. For the church to have pastors, the later should embrace their God-given role of childbearing so that they become mothers to the pastors. Broken homes breed lack of warmth and stability in children. The aspect of obedience which is usually derived from the fathers is even put at stake. With a culture that is very much against the large families, even where it is affordable, the subconscious of the future pastor is equally affected. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, a celibate priest who cannot beget children biologically should take it upon himself to beget children for the church and Christ through the sacraments. Another role as per Vatican Council II is played by families in imparting an environment that should assist the future pastor to put on guard against the dangers which threaten chastity, especially in the present society. What possible impact does coming from a highly polygamous family have one on one's ministry? Go, multiply and fill the earth. By nature, man and woman have to have, have this in our natural instincts. Even priests or even nuns or brothers fall into this category. To be able to resist and discipline oneself to live a celibate life 
One needs a lot of preparation in the environment in which he grows, prayer and support. A highly polygamous family, how will it prepare support and pray for the child to be celibate? And as I said, the subconscious is usual at, heart, at hand. The highly polygamous family will speak more than monogamy, not having only one commitment. From a polygamous family, there are many mothers, brothers, and sisters. Here is a big heart of the father who receives and embraces all without restriction. But this will receive all and embrace all. This receive all and embrace all may prove problematic for one desiring to embrace priestly ministry. How will the pastor speak about monogamy when people can point a finger to his own father, who's more than polygamous sometimes? How will he address the value of monogamy when he himself has never lived in such a family? During my ministry in the Archdiocese, some of the issues we used to come to arising out of arbitrations aren't Azalea Kana to Jakalabi Afingatu Abazala. We have his sister, we have the what he would be able to handle. The family itself is not even assisting the call of a celibate priest. What is the impact of coming from a superstitious family on the ministry or coming from a family that is full of Oksamira, our tradition ATR? Many of our actions are influenced by the, as I said, by the subconscious. A man may date short girls because subconsciously the ideal woman he knows is the short woman and that was his mother. So he also looks for a short girl to date. When one comes from a superstitious family, it plays on his subconscious. He could cite examples, I could, I could cite examples, but prudence demands otherwise. Because one had a superstitious mother, his ministry was disturbed by that superstition. Sometimes because of the inclination or weakness in the ministry, one will not come out strongly or even ignore that part of preaching and a prophetic voice. You are already compromised. There was a one traditional doctor who came to tell us, Ne father wa mwonu na yasi wa wanu, kati mwemu ngamba anko mewomu kerezia. Even your priest is always with us here. And now you are telling me, they will come back to the church. When he comes back to the church, I'll equally do what? But when we did our underground work, truly the family background, where the priest came from, was fully coming. Anyway, that was the type of family. Fear is another side of it. Because it is ingrained in, in one, one would fear those forces giving them a time more authority than the authority of God. One would also see Satan in everything. Satanic powers would be seen or interpreted everywhere. Nowadays, it is very common with the even charismatic aspect. In everything, there is Satan. Everything. Even the way it's a personal weakness, we are ascribing it to who? To Satan. Satan, Satan. When this cross comes down, it is the Satan that is Satan coming down. Everything. And sometimes we are not, we are no longer putting even that very aspect, so those of psychology and everything. Everything is Satan, Satan, Satan. I was a priest. I had a very, sorry to use the word, I had a very big quarrel with him. The Christian who went to him, that Christian had five masabo shrines, and they were in different sizes. There was like a small one, a big, big one, a medium, and a big one, the cathedral. So the Christian went to the priest. He told him, Father, I want to give up these things. I want you to burn them. The father, father brought a matchstick. He burnt the, sm the smallest one. And he told him, that is worth 500,000. The man put in the money. Then he told him, I have to go back, pray over it, so that I handle those big ones. The second one was worth 1.5. The man picked the money. He gave it in. Then the third one, he told him, that one needs a lot of novenas. And I have to do a lot. I remember he demanded 5 million shillings. 
the man looked for the money. He had something to empty. And then later on, I think some sense came back to him and said, is this what it means to be in the ministry? I thought that he was supposed to assist me to redeem me. So when he came to us, we did our background. That is how his father even used to operate. And I said, I think something was missing somewhere. Lack of moral and intellectual ground, grounding. Where is the moral reference point for this generation? There is a lot of moral subjectivity and relativism is very high. Anyway, who determines what is morally right even today? Fathers are symbols of strength and wisdom. Their absence leaves a lot to be desired in the intellectual grounding of the child. A child who has missed a parent during growth cannot integrate some of these qualities in his own definition of a father and a priest. Moral subjectivity. I was reading one case, it was in Europe, concerning child abuse. And then, in one of the aspects that was put down, when this abuse was taking place, the priest told this young chap, you see, we always say, this is my body which will be given up for you. You understand? So when they are saying, this is my body, which we cite in every mass, I was saying, this is my body. And remember, it's in direct speech now. Not this is his body. But now, he was telling the young child that this is my what? And the young man was being, is it brainwashed? I don't know what to use. This is my body. Who is determining the moral right today? What is morally right? Lack of nurturing and mentoring in the virtues of work has brought about what we term as the broiler syndrome in families. This is a notion among many parents today. Well, I suffered a lot while growing. I wouldn't like to see my children suffer. They find all types of excuses to stop their children from work. The parents give a new notion of suffering to the children which we should be aboard because it is very superficial and simplistic. The seminarian we fail to integrate the suffering cross into the practical life. He may, when he's studying theology, he may understand the gospel of the cross, but they may not see meaning in practical life as pastors. They will eventually fail to manage failure and will be constantly in the complaining mode over the state of a parish instead of working hard to uplift the, its status. And even when they are assigned to parishes, parishes never grow. Braille syndrome. Compare that situation, this current situation, with the first African priests when they were assigned to Mobiende Vicariate in the 1930s, when the experiment towards the African church autonomy all set through was being, was being done. Those priests did whatever it could take because they knew they had to sustain the parishes, they had to build the schools themselves, and they were real examples. The broiler syndrome. A broiler chicken, I'm a farmer, you give it, it feeds from there, it sleeps there, even when you put it outside, it's already conditioned, it is already seated. Broiler syndrome. I'm waiting for things to work themselves out. Can it be possible why even some of our church land is being taken? Because it's not being utilized. People are quite very lazy. The role of teachers, especially in primary and secondary levels. Vocation, fostering, and mobilization. Positive attitude towards the vocation is an important aspect in the formation of the future priest. In so many schools today, Many children don't want to embrace the vocation to being teachers. And many who do so see it as a last resort and not out of passion, unlike the former years. I left the chalk. It's not worth to be a teacher. Cardinal Wamala spoke about the role of teachers in the formation of future pastors at Tsubi Brothers. He said this, forming the conscience of the youth 
so that they match with their academic excellence is the biggest challenge facing the brothers of Christian instruction and all teachers in this era of technology. Unless you form their conscience to match peace, to match peace will be elusive, and values of integrity, honesty, and purity of heart will be archaic, and those people who practice those values will be termed as conservative, traditional, etc. I usually hear these words even in church circle. That one is so conservative. That one is so traditional. It is. Now, having lost the values of integrity, we are having a lot of issues even in our own parishes. We don't want systems. We want always to break them. When it comes to finances, it becomes another mess. Not all parishes, I shouldn't generalize, but many. We are part of already the bandwagon. Stealing is, part, is becoming part of us because society is no longer seeing it as a value. My father stole somebody else's wife. Stealing starts. That means I was begot out of stealing. My father stole money so that I went through the primary through the schools. What next? He had to get money so that I still exams to pass. When I come to even I had to buy my degree. When it comes to a job, I have to bribe the people who are doing the interview. So, from the word go, everything is full of what? Does it happen in these circumstances? I don't know. But society breeds its own. Sooner than later, we shall see such a thing. How? You will see a lot of lobbying. That is the starting of the whole Whatever I send you, is there nothing? Are there no souls to be saved? They are there, but it's not also bad also to work there. The role of the laity in the pastoral spiritual year. Every future pastor of the Catholic Church has a chance of having a spiritual year of apprenticeship. It is a year of discernment and having practical reality over what one intends to embrace. Questions. What is the expectation of the seminary from the parish or the school in which the, young, the seminarian has been sent in terms of appraisal? Are your expectations so clear when you send someone? What are the key elements to examine? We should recall that this is a young man usually in the middle youth years, who is still to be molded much as is still, is still expected to be mature. The pastoral year appraisal should be more focused on assisting the candidate to improve on the gray areas other than a condemnation and having a litany of what is not being accomplished in the seminarian. We should have clear parameters of what we are expecting to improve in a young man who is sent out there. Issues that could have arisen, what are the areas in which the young man is good? What are the areas that need improvement? Issues that could have arisen during the pastoral year, but are purely human weakness, but can be ironed out in time. Areas that need outright condemnation. We should avoid hoodwinking in this exercise. What was supposed to be corrected and is brought out when one is going to the diaconate? is a sign that there is a break in the chain. I did the pastoral four years ago, and the issue is brought out at that when you are doing your pastoral, this issue, couldn't we handle it if it was quite very important? By the time you left it go on, unless there were efforts to have improvement along the way. That means it could be accommodatable. Was there intention for this candidate to be assisted is there meaningful and timely feedback? Up to what extent is the engagement of the vocations team with the assessors in this preliminary stage? I recall a remark from one lady when I was visiting, visiting one parish during my tenure as Archdiocese and Sabah Christ. The lady commented, the seminarian you gave us is very rich in the ministry, but is zero in character. The opposite could equally be true. Is rich in character 
but who are in the ministry. Now, this was somebody who was looking at the seminary. So I had to take upon myself, what do you mean that he's rich in the ministry, but zero in character? I said, he's a good, uh, whatever, he reads the reading where he, I think he's the uh, acolyte and let, uh, la? Yeah, he, that one he does well, even does well the, the teaching over the religious instruction to the children. Then I asked, what about character? He said, I tell you, you put money before him. That's when you see what it means. Sava Christ, you just sponsor him an outing. Make sure there's some little beer. Then when you see what he is. Possibly that was the zero in character. I'm of the view that as an institution, we need some degree of structured pastoral year program. A young man is sent to the parish. There's no orientation. There's no nothing. He just ooh, start from there. Start from what am I supposed to do? You learn as you go on. I think even orientation is quite important. Welcome to Gaba Seminary, Father X. You're having nine houses. You're having so many students. This is what you do when you do this. This is where you go. Please, of course, you're already aware that you're going to be teaching moral theology. Thank you very much. Your lessons will be like this. Please, this, this. There's an orientation. Instead of one finding his campus all around. Which particular roles one is going to handle? Is there a constant journeying with the candidate? The word is to journey with the candidate. I believe every parish has got some good intentioned people who are immature in faith, character, and are objective. Can they journey with the seminarian and assist, and assist in mentoring, coaching, so that the future pastor is in the world but does not belong to the world. This journey should not stop even at pastoral work. The first five years of when one is ordained are quite very crucial. There should be some degree of journey with someone when even is ordained. The first five years, I was reading feedback in an American journal, my first five years of priesthood, and there was always a comment. Now, this was in America. I was always finding myself lost. I was looking for a priest with whom I could journey with in my first five years. So those first five years, I think, are quite very, very important. I thought even during the pastoral year, is it possible to have a month for a seminarian to, to work within the corporate world, to have a sense of the corporate world? One month in the 12 months, in the 12 months he spends on the pastoral. And the purpose is not to work for money, but to appreciate even what the corporate world is. You could pick on particular companies. You know that these are good companies with our good Catholics, and you tell them from the word go what your mission is all about. Finally, in this respect, a priestly vocation is a treasure in the clay. When I'm mentoring, how do I handle this clay so that it suffices to an extent and the rest we leave to the Lord. I'm aware you are clay, but how do I handle even the clay to enable it to have the treasure? When some people are sent to parishes, they are seen just like any other worker. But I'm, saying, I'm being given someone to mentor into priesthood, not any other worker, like a secretary or what. So how do I mentor the clay to get the face brick I want? How do I mentor the clay so that I get the pot I want? I may get a pot, when my intention was to get a roof tile. Is the, is the way roof tile done the same way a pot done, much as it's all clay? But because I'm aware that the priestly vocation is treasure, we need to look into that aspect. Support to the seminary. The role of the laity in supporting the seminary is quite very important. Building and maintaining a seminary is no mini job. Our forefathers did a lot in the early 20th century in supporting this cause with the Bishop Henry Stensey at especially when Katigon was being set up. The very donation of land by the Catholic chiefs in Uganda was a positive step. We see the efforts of such people like Alex Seboa, Stanislas Mugwanya, Biandi Alagabuleri who gave in in Swangere Seminary land, and others. Support for the seminary 
I think we should stop giving assemblies that were well off. We no longer need that aid. Rome is closing its taps. That means the duty to sustain our seminaries belongs to the laity. It's part of their duty. The very presence of political chiefs during those old times on every ordination was a sign of strong moral support for the priestly vocation. Support for the needed seminarians. I've been involved in a number of campaigns for the cause of seminarians by virtue of being an archdiocesan head of laity and also in my private capacity. The church should not be deprived of future pastors because of lack of seminary tuition. It is a moral obligation and incumbent upon the laity to ensure that whoever is in the seminary, especially at higher level, should not lose a vocation because of lack of tuition. Unfortunately, you hear very few voices even among the priests themselves to this cause. Worse still, even on Vocations Day, the Vocations Day collection, which is internationally recognized, is seen in some parishes as a competitor with other parish projects. The vigor with which parish projects are boosted does not match at all with the causes for the future priests. Honest and transparency is also needed. And integrity are equally important in this respect of, on behalf of the seminarians, if they are to be supported. I've seen and I've already said about, talked about it. You find a seminarian who says he's lacking fees and he needs a benefactor. But on his list, he has got close to five benefactors and is not disclosing it and is depriving of others. They would be our future pastors. So it's quite very important. Ite? comes into play. Use of laity in provision of services in modern professionalism and sciences. One of the roles and duties of the lay faithful in the church is to harness all forms of resources at their disposal for the cause and progress of the church in accordance with the times. Beyond philosophy and theology, there are so many disciplines which are of essence and importance to any priest in our days today. Some of these disciplines even don't diminish the vocation of the priest, but to the contrary, add value to it. Special needs ministry like the deaf, the blind, and the mentally retarded cases. Who handles them? We assume that everybody in the church, is no, there are no deaf people. Who handles them? What's wrong with having somebody who's an interpreter? as you are giving his, your homily, and even these disadvantaged people are getting something. Who handles the mentally retarded? We have hospital chaplains, but how many of our priests can able to do hospital ministry beyond the sacraments? Hospital ministry in the U.S., it is a very big ministry. Recall that the church is a hospital. Does the counseling we do fit in the circumstances or we are possibly still locked in the traditional pastoral counseling methods. We are living in a very stressful world today, and many of the elements we are handling, we are handling them as if they are diabolic or demonic. But in actual fact, they are psychiatric cases. How far have we used IT for the cause of the church? Statistics for the cause of the church financial management, and others. I remember sometime, some few years ago, there were some good Christians who had proposed to the Episcopal Conference to do pro bono services to seminaries, major seminaries, and they could offer one or two lectures in every month on financial management. And the bishop said, uh, you wait a bit. We shall tell you when such are supposed to come. It was pro bono. They are not to be even given money. Conclusion, the duty of fostering, forming, and assisting future pastors of our church is of paramount importance. The first person who best understands this future pastor is the family and is in the role. If we need good pastors formed in the heart of Christ himself, we need to take special care of the family. For every priest comes from the society and is returned to society. 
If the later through the family give the church garbage, the seminar will churn it, upgrade it, and get some biogas for usage, but by and large, it will put out garbage also. Let pastoral training put emphasis on the family. Let vocations team endeavor to be in full touch with the families where our future pastors come from. Let them be objective in making the analysis of the family environment so that we get priests from all those environments but molded in the heart of Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd and high priest. Thank you for listening to me. I wish to acknowledge some of the, the, the information I got it from, including Abaganda, Eyenono, by Professor Jesse Sekamwa, the history of the African priest by Father Dr. Late Waligo, Cardinal Wamala's reflection on the word of God by Fred Sechito, and my personal interviews with Father Augustine Paji, who is an exorcist and a herbalist. I wish to thank you very, very much for listening to me. May God bless you. Okay, uh, a little more. That's not adequate. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matega, for that uh, very well thought out uh, presentation on the role of the late. Now that he has uh, finished speaking, I can give the final introduction of him. Uh, he's not only a former uh, Sava Christ of Kampala and the national vice president of the late, he's also a Papal Knight, Kampala Archdiocese. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, and Papal Knights are universal. So he's a purple knight wherever he is. May not be putting on the, the regalia, but I think on November 12th we shall see him <laughs> in, the, in the regalia. I thank you very much. You have brought out many issues. Academically, my summary of his presentation is longer than his paper. So if I said I give the summary of what I picked from him, it will be longer than his presentation. So I not go that direction. I only appraise you for looking at this reformation from the family to the institutional uh, in terms of the later, And we thank you for that. And at one point when you mentioned uh, that your paper was on the formation of the future priests, then I remembered the, my small personal contribution to what is the formation of a former seminarian. 26 years ago, uh, one of our contemporaries was uh, we were all preparing for his uh, priest reformation, I mean priest ordination, and when the letters came, his name was not there. We were all very sad, we said what has happened, we have worked with him right from primary, and we were calling him father, father, you know, the way we call you father when you look a priest in the primary. So he was father, father, 26 years ago, and the letter did not come out. So everyone was sad, everyone was saying that is God is planned, that's what has happened. I took courage, I said I go to the bishop and, they, and find out. At that time there were no phones, so I had to make my way to Hoima. And when the bishop saw me, he said, Ah, Vincent, I've been also looking for you. But first tell me why you have come. So I said, My Lord Bishop, the Connex is not on the list. What could have happened? For us as the, his late companions, we really called him father all these years, and were looking towards his ordination. The bishop said, actually, that's why he wanted you. Since you are somehow an opinion leader, I wanted you to know that uh, he has to come down. I, 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 he needs to come down. Those were the words of the bishop. So, I said, do I go and tell him? He said, yeah, tell him he has to do what? To come down. So when I went back, I told him, Deacon, you have to Calm down. He said, I'm already down. <laughs> yes, so. But for a whole year, we were reminding him, I was reminding him, joking, I said, calm down. So this year, when he was celebrating 25 years of priestly ordination, I mentioned to the public, I said, Father, calm down. <laughs> yes, but he came down and is one of our good priests in Hoima. So that was the contribution towards the formation of the, the deacon, because he was up there and I reminded him to come down. 
<laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, time is not on our side. Uh, what we shall do, I will invite uh, Monsenio Severius to come and uh, take up part of this uh, podium. No, you will stay there also. Uh, Father Severius will come and uh, answer some of the questions which you were asked. And then we shall pose a maximum of three questions uh, to Mr. Matega. But we encourage you to write many more and bring them here. They are going to be part of the debate. You know this lecture is not ending. We, are, we have started a debate. So um, the dean will arrange group, group discussions over the questions that you are going to bring. So may I ask Father uh, Sylvester to come here, Silverius to come here. I remember when he was a dean, uh, one of the contributions I have made possibly uh, when uh, Father was a dean, uh, he invited us here from the youth office to come and talk to the seminarians. And Father, now when I go around the country, I meet many priests said, yes, your talk about HIV, AIDS, and behavior change was very helpful. So we contributed towards his work as a dean, and they still praise him because he invited us to come and talk to the seminarians. And I think that is how we can bridge the gap uh, towards the formation. So that is one of the tools. Uh, you had further question, which we start with, what are the tools and who is the, the, what is the tool to sharpen the what? The tool. Yes, the tool to sharpen the tool. I think, Shari, is okay there? Okay. So, Father, answer the questions. Many time, uh, Deacon, you get the questions for Mr. Matega on paper so that he comes and answers them. You already has, I think, three from uh, online. Yes, Father, take over. So, once again, I'm here, and I have some questions that were asked me. Uh, the principle is that there will be more questions than answers, and a good question is much more important than an answer. Because, <laughs> yes, so even if I don't answer your question, please have questions. Because that is more important. Uh, that there is a question then that I simply give an answer. Because I, can, I could give the wrong answer, but the question can be right, and it is usually right. So the first question was from Father Senyondo Charles. Which tools to sharpen? And which tools to sharpen these tools is what he wanted to, to know. And it is in this case that uh, Questions and answers are not always fair. Uh, I was reading a book called Seven Habits of Most Effective People. And one of the sections is about sharpening tools. And one of the problems with tools is that each, uh, each, uh, each, uh, can say each profession has its own tools. You cannot even say that a computer is your tool because you are not a secretary. And yet you are teaching. So tools are a complex thing. But what is important is that we get some experts to identify the tools we are using or not using, and those that we are using that are already not sharpened, to sharpen them up. And also, it is important that a person takes time to reflect on what he is doing and with what he is doing it, and if it is that which needs to be sharpened. So if you ask me which tool you are using, I may not be able to know. But I know that you have tools to use for what you are doing. So that is why I'm telling you that there will be, it's better to have questions than to have simple answers. But if you have got that, question, that book, uh, The Seven Habits of Most Effective People, it would be good to take it. It's heavy reading, but it is worth reading. That is the best answer I can give today. Otherwise, I would go through the whole book about, uh, about uh, whatever, about... To, um, making programs, about revising programs, about being proactive, and the like. And that is a long 
process. But the important thing is really to get a good evaluation, know what, uh, what your challenges especially that we have, the, 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 the positive, the negative, the opportunities, and to put the priorities in place. Is, can that sound as a good answer? Probably that is the best I can do for the time being. Secondly, there was another one by, you know some of the, when you teach some people, they become cleverer than you are, so don't be surprised when it becomes harder to get answers. And then another one is by Father Kimboa, or Chim, yes, Chimboa, internal, internal leadership. There were the issues of electing students, leaders, the experiences we had as students and as staff. This was one of the places in which unity was usually flouted or met great challenges. And uh, in some, some, on some election days, we felt that we may have needed security. <laughs> but still seminarians remained seminarians. There was a way of man managing issues and we still went ahead. And there were problems, there were issues of personalizing issues instead of dealing with issues as they are, and the dynamics within the seminary um, society, but of different backgrounds. And I don't know whether this has happened, uh, it, whether things have changed, I hear Katigondo put in a rota of changing your, um, this year, somebody from this area does the work, another way, another one there. And if this issue could uh, get solved, uh, probably the problem of unity in the seminaries would be easier met. But for me, what I still believe is that no year as a student and as a, a, a formator where seminarians and staff directly approached or dealt with or shown that they have a special task of building unity here. And I don't remember whether we ever discussed it as such. So it is something that is supposed to be done but I don't remember that it was taken up as a special task. And that for me, I think it is a, we have glossed over it. And until it is done, maybe it is a, a, we are afraid of it because it might be explosive. But what is the use of putting bullets in firewood, putting them in a fire, and then they begin exploding? Why don't you identify them before? Deal with them and see what you can do. So I think there is a responsibility according to me and I feel, feel I was not able to do it because maybe I was part of dynamics. I'm convinced that the time has, is ripe for staff and students to openly sit down and deal with this issue of unity and solidarity. That is what I was thinking as a better answer than simply saying what was at stake. But it was not very good. Though maybe those who, who came after me and before me had it better than myself. But um, I didn't see, um, morally speaking, and in other, in other ways, I didn't like it. It's one of the things that you felt, can this be done in the seminaries? And I hope it is no longer being done in the seminaries. But we have got an obligation and a duty um, to sit down and if the tools here were not in place, we put tools in place and we sharpen them properly and we build unity of clergy in this country and for me in the whole of Africa. Why should you be happy when you are called a German or an Englishman and you cannot be happy when you are called a Congolese or 
or Rwandese or Sudanese. It, it is trash. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> there is something from Mr. Sempa Robert that leadership is everything. But I think it was more of a, a, a compliment. And the, where you have got good leaders, everything moves. And where leaders are lacking, things just slump, if not go backward. The first thing I think, may, can I finish with this? The first one, I appreciate very much the contributions of Monsignor Lokel Philip about our being black. I taught a bit of Pan-Africanism here as part of a course about new, something about new, what? Um, uh, well, I will have to check, but it is important to understand that when you are speaking about modern Africa, it is important to speak about our being black. You, you have to speak about slavery and you have to speak about colonialism effect and the pretenses we have about them. But as an African, you have to, you have, it is important to appreciate that we, have, we are Africa, we have certain issues that have come up, and some of us have tried to run away from being Africans, but it is better that we deal with our being Africans. Like unity needs to be dealt with, even our Africanness needs to be dealt with. Okay, I think I will... That's all I can say. Thank you for your opportunities. Okay, I think I will thank for, uh, Dr. Svelio at that point. Uh, thank yes. you very much. Um, yes. We have many questions for the later, but the time is not on my side. Yes, So thank what you. I wanted to do is to wrap up Mr. Matega's presentation by asking my two sisters in the audience to give you a minute each as the later. Your words will be summarizing uh, the questions that uh, Mr. Matega could have answered. So, uh, in case, we, because we need it. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Father, for that uh, rejoinder. And in your presentation earlier, you talked about uh, management in the church. I wanted to rejoin that those of you who receive Leadership Magazine, I have been serializing there an article every month for the past 22 years talking about management in the church. We must be professional. At St. Charles Ruanga Castle Community Moves, our motto is professional with Christ. We cannot say we are a church, we don't write minas, we don't audit our books, we don't communicate, we don't write reports. We must become professional. And there are many professionals out there who must participate in church leadership, church formation. So it is very important as seminarians in your formation, you know you are going to deal with the people and you must communicate, you must handle uh, relations, you must handle interpersonal conflicts and all those management things. So uh, let me ask my two sisters a minute each. I think the, the mic, uh, Deacon, take the mic to them down so that uh, she gives them. Yeah. Our, our late sisters in the room. Thank you so much. I would like to observe the protocol. Zako Joyce is my name, and I always like telling people I come from the USA, United States of Arua. And, <laughs> and I work as the national youth. Yeah, in the youth apostolate, you have to brand yourself. Even as young priests to be, you have to brand yourself so that you are able to attract many young people into the church. Now, uh, mine is just a compliment or... Uh, a gap that I have realized, especially the component where I really handle youth issues. I have realized there's a gap in this area that many of our priests now, actually the focus of the formation is more of a family-centered issue. And when it comes to the payment and taking care of the student and everything, Seminary formation has become a little bit secular, like any other secondary formation, meaning that the families are actually 100% responsible 
to make sure that this student succeeds in life. Even if some of you have been supported by other Christian communities or individuals. But the bigger portion is that your formation is entirely in the hands of your family members. Now, why I'm saying there's a gap there is this. Now, as a young priest, you have concluded, you, you know, you disguise yourself. I want to use this word. You pretend to be nice. In, in, my, in my culture, they'll say a woman covers herself to get married. And once she's married, she starts revealing out a true self. Sometimes it happens also in the seminary formation. Now, when the student who has become a priest is fully a priest, the focus of this priest who is supposed to be for the community is actually centered more to the family. Why? He still feels that attachment of being close to the people who have seen him through. Now, the bigger Christian communities start complaining about this single boy who has been raised by the family and he's expected to serve the whole entirety of humanity. That is the complexity in which we have found ourselves when it comes to the issue of formation. As families were also bleeding, sometimes we see we do not have the support. We, do, we don't have the support. Where is the support coming from? Again, from the bigger Christian community. So when we're doing the formation, it has to be all round. Even those who are doing the pastoral, is it what? Pastoral year of formation something. When you're doing that, you also need to interface with the families as well. It's not about knowing how good is this seminarian to be, but how supportive are you to the family to make sure that they support this child of theirs and giving it to the church. Usually they hand you over, not so. You are there in between your parents. They take you. So thank you so much. When we're doing the formation, it has to be in totality. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our presenters. They did a great work. I would like to thank our dear seminarians that thank you for choosing Christ. There's one important thing which I always believe. Christ, just one man, changed the whole world, changed the universe. So which, which means that when we understand the Christ who has called us, each one of us, it means we shall also be able to change the universe. When we understand who Christ is, and what he stands for. The rest will automatically fall in line. So let us love one another. That is the basic, that if you love one another, if we love one another, that love of God will spread through. And love is to die, is to die to self, is to die to selfishness, it is to die to abuse, and that is the, the mission of Christ here on earth. To love, to teach us to love, and to win souls for Christ. I thank you so much for listening to me. Love one another, love your vocation, love every single bit of what you do. Then you will attract other people to what you're doing. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much for the remarks and questions which you are going to answer online and finalizing whatever we have.
as we said, the dialogue between the, the clergy and the laity is quite very important. In UNCLA, that's Uganda National Catholic Council of the Lay Apostolate, we started a series, and our tagline is, UNCLA listens, UNCLA speaks. And it was so much ingrained in the spirit of this synod on synodality. We have had very good presentations, and we have had very little response from many of the, even the members of the clergy. Recently, we had one on professionalism in running of parishes. It was a very good one. We saw some priests. The same presentation was given to the seminarians in St. Imbaga. I think it was something that was worth. It augments and even puts more. So let us, under Zoom, let us listen to them. There were 600 and something people who Zoomed in, but there were hardly five priests. And we are talking about management of parishes. There was another one which was quite very important, balancing between the ministry, the family, and the job. I'm a Sabah Christo ministry. I'm a family man, family, and the job. How do you balance? What looks to be far-fetched equally has impact on you. As a priest, how do you manage the ministry? And even your family as a family at home and other things. So in order to deal with intellectual mediocrity, as one said it, we need to listen and know the mind of the people for the greater benefit of everybody. I believe that with a good foundation, we shall get good pastors albeit the challenges that we are going through. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, there was one question which was directed uh, at me. I will answer it online. It, it says, what is my take on introducing uh, deacons in the final pastoral year to the corporate world? I will answer that online and share my, my thoughts about introducing them to the corporate world. I must thank you for having been a very good audience. Afternoon is not usually easy, but you have been very attentive, and I thank you, my presenter, my discussants, and the whole of the audience. Now back to Dr. Mabunda to wind up the session. Thank you very much for us here, moderators, for guiding us through this session of the public lecture. I will ask at this moment the rector to come forward and give his concluding remarks and close this session. Thank you all for your kind attention and for your patience. Governor National Seminary at 50. Governor is speaking. Gaba is discussing her life. Gaba is consulting, acknowledging her positives and her negatives. Gaba has a great desire to embark on a new phase of life with the courage and with a better positioning in today's changing world. You have helped us in this task, enormous task. Thank you, our dear discussants. Thank you, my good friend. Very, very practicing pagan and priest and philosopher and researcher. How do I explain it? Describe Chisoga. Thank you very much. Father Silverio. I didn't study here. I didn't have. Uh, I was hearing from you. You have presented in an amazing way. That we didn't want you to go back to Kabare. Thank you very much. Mr. Matega, wonderful for putting us in touch with the family and the late. Our dear moderators, you have made this interesting. Even the afternoon, we are still able to follow. Thank you very much. Father Magundus, we have tried, we have tried to use your bell. Sorry if you have not obeyed, but you have made it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters, for having participated in this academic and social endeavor. 
as we prepare to celebrate meaningfully our 50 years of GABA. Come November 12th, we hope to see you all, not on an academic platform, but also we need to eat and drink. God bless you all. And I'm requesting my fellow rector, Father Giuseppe, you know, Giuseppe on Serunjoji, to bless us. Thank you. May we rise and pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For our Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for all the deliberations you have enabled us to engage in. As we conclude our public lecture, bless all of us. Bless those who have presented and bless whoever has prepared this day. All for the greater glory of your name. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. It was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Amen. The Lord be with you. Might God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, everybody. Yoga, 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 yoga